Good evening. Calling to order the regular meeting of the Sonoma Planning Commission. And um, at this point, we'll do the roll call, please. Commissioner Barbos? Here. Commissioner O'Gorman Jenkins? Here. Commissioner O'Neill? Here. Commissioner Willers? Here. Commissioner Wyrick? Here. Vice Chair Dombach? Here. And Chair Burnett? Present. Everyone's here. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the approval of the agenda. Uh, this is an opportunity for Commission members to uh, suggest a reordering of the agenda or other comments pertaining to its contents. Do I hear any proposed changes? Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? Motion to approve the agenda. Second. Okay, we have a, we have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Barbos? Yes. Commissioner O'Gorman Jenkins? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Yes. Commissioner Willers? Yes. Commissioner Wyrick? Yes. Vice Chair Dombach? Yes. And Chair Burnett? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Now uh, we have the opportunity to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Woods, how would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight? Okay, the next order of business um, will be uh, comments from the public. Uh, this is an opportunity for members of the public to address the Commission on any items that do not appear on tonight's agenda. Uh, you, if you have comments on an agenda item, you will have an opportunity to speak as the public always does on all agenda items. But this is an opportunity to come up and raise a topic that is not on the agenda. All right, seeing none, we will move on to the uh, consent calendar. The consent calendar uh, contains items that will be covered uh, uh, in one motion. In the case of tonight, we have two items on the consent calendar. We have the draft PC meeting minutes of 321-24 and the draft joint meeting minutes of 229-24. And so we'll um, approve these separately, and uh, th and we'll start with three one. Does anyone wish to make any comments on the draft minutes of three twenty one? Seeing none, I'll uh, entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Barbos. I'll abstain. I wasn't at that meeting. Commissioner O'Gorman Jenkins. I'll abstain also. Thank you. I wasn't present. Commissioner O'Neill. Um, yes. Commissioner Willers. Yes. Commissioner Wyrick. Yes. Vice Chair Dombach. Yes. Chair Barnett. Aye. The motion passes five to two. Thank you. Now we move on to 3.2, the minutes of the joint meeting. This was the special meeting with the three commissions and their chairs of 229-24. Anyone have any changes, suggestions, comments about the minutes? Seeing none, can I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, motion and a second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Barbos? Again, I'll abstain. I wasn't there. Commissioner O'Gorman Jenkins? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Abstain. Commissioner Willers? Yes. Commissioner Wyrick? Yes. Vice Chair Dombach? Yes. Chair Barnett? Aye. The motion passes 5 to 2. Okay. Thank you very much. Now we'll move into the public hearing portion of the meeting. Uh, the first item on the agenda is item 4.1, consideration, discussion, and action to adopt a resolution approving the exception application of George Bevan for a structure uh, in a rear yard setback at 400 La Quinta. And uh, we'll start with a staff report, please. I guess I don't need that. Just waiting for the. Is it on that side? I can get 
started anyway. Uh, the project before the Planning Commission this evening is at La Quinta Lane, which is located in our south, um, sorry, central west planning area. Let's see, is that going to work? Can, can you guys see it? Nope, we're seeing a uh, lovely and rhythmic <laughs> pattern on the screen. That's all right, I'll try one more time and then I will... There we go. Mm, nothing, honey. Oh, you guys can't see it? Now we got it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I can see it. All right, here we go. There's the project location. It's kind of a cool little tucked away piece of property that is accessed off Fifth Street West and backs up to Nathanson Creek. It's a unique property for the neighborhood. It is much larger than all of the houses around it. We're in the Central West Planning Area. The required setbacks are a 20-foot front setback and rear, and five-foot minimum side with a 15-foot combined. You have the existing site plan that shows where the pool and pool house would be in the rear of the property. Don't go too fast. Point out to me where the pool is. Right. Dark I'm trying yeah, to orient dark myself. Dark. Can you see him? On the right side. Bottom right. I see. Okay, thank you. And so I, I guess while I have this up, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the the setbacks. It's a little bit hard to see, but the, the this, it's an oddly shaped property. And so the right, the property line on the right, that is the rear. And the edge of the, the uh, parcel is basically the edge of the pavement, I believe, for the bike path. Um, so it, the accessory structure is proposed to be located 18 feet, 6 inches from the rear property line. Here is the pool house that's being proposed. It would total 651 square feet. And the, this is a kind of a unique issue. Typically, detached accessory structures meet our, our, our provision of the code to be located five feet from the property line. And the issue here is kind of an interesting policy discussion as well as a, an exception discussion. So the exception is to be located within that rear setback because of the maximum wall height. So uh, Sonoma Municipal Code Section 1950.080 outlines standards for detached accessory structures attached and detached. And in order for a structure to be located between basically that 20 foot setback and five feet, it needs to meet a three prong height test. The exterior wall cannot be any higher than nine feet. At a point 13 feet, at, at a point 10 feet in from the property line, it can't exceed 13 feet, as well as having a maximum height says five feet. Excuse me, that was 15. And essentially, what this forces is for a detached accessory structure to be located within five feet to whatever the setback, rear setback is, it has to have a hip roof element. Very commonly, we have projects that come in where they want to have a shed roof. And so the issue that we're dealing with, so the maximum height of the structure is 13 feet, 6 inches. So it's less than the overall height. The wall height at the shortest part is 9 feet, but at the tallest point, it's about 13 feet in height. So we're doing an exception for the little sliver that exceeds that 9 feet in height. And excuse me, uh, Christina, on the previous um, visual you presented, um, it showed um, uh, trees at the rear of the property line. Is that as the property actually looks, or is this a rendering? This is a rendering, but I believe there's trees in the back and the. Um, but this is not necessarily the configuration of those trees I, or the appearance I don't of them. No, I can't comment on that. Okay. Is, is, do, you, do you know if the architect is here tonight? The architect is not here tonight. I believe the property owners might be. If you look yeah. at Google Earth, uh, you know, and obviously you wouldn't know when the picture was taken, but it does appear to be a similar. Okay, well, dream. when the yeah. when the property owner comes up, yeah. we can. Yeah, and we I mean, I've walked the, the path, and you, it's very hard to see. In. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, that's that's pretty much it in a nutshell, that they would like to have a, a shed roof, and our code does not require, does not allow that to be within that, that setback. So it could actually be taller and five feet from the property line if it met that wall height requirement. And the, the recommendation from staff is that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution approving the exception subject to findings and conditions of approval. 
Okay, thank I'll, you. I'll pull these pictures back up because I'm sure we'll want okay. them for discussion. Uh, before we get into the subject matter of this agenda item, um, I would like to give the members of the Commission an opportunity to disclose any ex parte communication you have had with an interested party on this project. Okay, seeing none, then we will move on to um, the uh, opportunity for public comment. Um, unless there are questions of staff, please. Um, Christina, I was trying to figure out what is behind this property. You mentioned the bike path. That's, I was having a little difficulty figuring that piece out because it is a weird lot. It, it is. It's really big. And the follow-up question, if there is a property behind there, is has there been any input or discussion with the neighbor? I've only had one question from a neighbor, and your question might be better directed to the, the homeowner. Okay, any other questions for staff? No, then we'll open up for public comment. So uh, certainly step forward, give your name, and make your comment. Good evening, my name is Fred Allabach, uh, Chair Barnett, members of the Planning Commission and City Staff. Since I came down tonight, um, I thought I would just share my kind of kid in the candy store department comment and that I couldn't help but notice that this pool house was 50 feet shy of being twice as big as my apartment. So that's my comment. Thank you. Um, and uh, the applicant, would you like to step up and um, address the commission and maybe give us a chance to ask a few questions. Certainly. My name is Susan Ostback. I am uh, one of the property owners. My husband, Graham Crawford, couldn't be here tonight. But um, this is a, a small pool house for our family uh, and parents to come and enjoy. It is nowhere near the creek. It's on the opposite oh, end yep. of the property. <laughs> so uh, it, we've spoken to our neighbors and there are trees surrounding it that um, uh, do not impose upon anybody, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, the back of the property, is there a fence? Behind? Correct. And it's a standard six, seven foot Correct. fence? With trees in, in front of that. There are trees in front of it and on the other side of the Correct. fence, are there trees as well? Correct. Okay, thank you. And uh, any other questions for the applicant? Yes. Question. It may be a naive question. Um, so is, we're talking about like a foot, you know, and and uh, a quarter here. And I'm just curious um, whether it, it just can be moved in a little bit so that we we kind of avoid this whole situation and it, wait and think about it. It's to do with symmetry, you know, in terms of of the the look of it fitting on on the pool. And and so there are no trees. We've spoken to our neighbors in terms of if they would have any argument against it, and they've express to us that they don't and and uh, um, it, it's it's in a space that there's ample space but it's it's just to do with the placement and and the visual symmetry of how it looks okay Thank yeah we did speak with the, the architect and the property owner about their options to uh, to avoid that but it's a it's a foot and a half and when you look at the the closer site plan it's just having it lined up with the the back of the pool so um, like I mentioned if they had a hip roof it could be taller it's just really the wall height that's the issue well, and, and one comment is it is on well property so there are lines that go through that we have to try and fit within that that uh, space okay any other questions thank you very much thank you. and are there others uh, in attendance who would like to address the Commission on this item seeing none I will close the public hearing, bring it back to the commission for discussion and uh, decision. Who would like to start? I'll make a motion that we approve, adopt the resolution for the exception. I'll second that motion. All right, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion about the motion? Seeing none, let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Barbos? Yes. Commissioner O'Gorman Jenkins? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Yes. Commissioner Willers? Yes. Commissioner Wyrick? Yes. Vice Chair Dombach? 
Yes. Chair Barnett? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending. Good luck with your project. All right, we're now going to move on to item 4.2, um, which is discussion, consideration, possible action to adopt a resolution approving the use permit and wine tasting use permit application of Michael Ross, no stranger to this commission, to allow a vacation rental and wine tasting facility at 301 First Street West. And now we'll have the staff report, please. Thank you, Commissioners. I'm going to start with a little bit of history on the property. It's uh, been before the Commission and Design Review multiple times in the last five or so years. The primary permit that is governing the property at the moment is a May 2018 adaptive reuse permit that authorized the restoration, seismic re retrofit, and adaptive reuse of the, the cooperage and the barn. What is approved in the 2018 use permit is limited retail use of the first floor, residential use of the second floor, the use of the existing barn to convert it to an accessory dwelling unit, and also approved the use of uh, seismic retrofit credits for parking. There are specific conditions of approval to the 2018 uh, use permit that are identified below. Most specific to our discussion this evening is the first one about the limited retail use uh, on the ground floor, the hours of operation, and uh, the fact that there is a condition of approval that states that further use of the property for a sh short term vacation rental shall be prohibited. In general, the process that we're going through this evening is similar to what we do for many use permits, that they come before the commission for conditions of approval to be amended. And that is in line with our, our standard practices that we do for a restaurant, um, for wine tasting use permits, th things like that. So the, the project site as it stands today, it's a 7,500 square foot parcel that is developed with a 5,000 square foot historic two-story building. There's a 1,600 square foot barn. Part of that barn is an 800 square foot ADU, as well as a common uh, fitness area. And I believe the detached garage was uh, taken down, so my, uh, my apologies for that. The property is a contributing resource to the Sonoma Depot Historic District as a commercial building. And so that's really the nexus for the adaptive reuse provision, which is contained in our uh, historic uh, resource code, uh, excuse me, our historic preservation code in the Sonoma Municipal Code, uh, just 1942. So the first story was constructed in 1906 and the second story in 1923. There are three tandem uncovered parking spaces that were approved through that use permit in 2018. The applicant is currently before the Planning Commission to request an amendment to the 2018 use permit to expand to have a wine tasting facility on the lower floor as well as a vacation rental on the, the upper, upper floor. So the vacation rental component would be a short-term rental it, totaling 2,500 square feet approximately. There are two bedrooms as well as the library that would be accessible for a vacation rental. And the narrative states that guests would be limited uh, to one to six people. Our code does have specific requirements for vacation rentals that have limits on the number of people who can stay based on the number of bedrooms. And that's been included as a condition of approval. Regarding the wine tasting use permit, the proposal is to have shared space with that existing allowed retail use on that lower floor and that it would be sort of a, a shared space with retail as well as a wine tasting facility. And that would be the whole lower floor that's being requested at 2,532 square feet. The requested hours of operation are 9 to 7 p.m., six days a week, and anticipated two to four employees. Staff has recommended a condition of approval to shorten the hours of operation for the wine tasting facility to shut that down at 5 o'clock. The uh, adaptive reuse provision of the code is in Chapter 1942.030, and it has created a permitting process to allow the adaptive reuse of historic structures. 
that are not otherwise allowed in the zoning district. And just for everyone's edification, the, the zoning for this property is medium density residential. And that really is kind of the crux of the issue this evening that we have a residentially zoned property that historically has been used for commercial and trying to balance the competing needs of the neighbors and the property and respecting the historic nature of the structure as well. So the there's only certain structures can utilize this provision of the code. They have to be officially designated for the state or uh, national register, or they can have potential historic value. Vacation rentals cannot be structures that just have historic value. They have to be uh, officially designated. This property does qualify as a contributing element to our historic training district. So our code breaks down allowable residential uses and non-residential uses. We're talking with commercial uses today. So what is allowed under the code is to request in a zoning district that doesn't normally allow it, the use of a bed and breakfast, a hotel, limited retail, mixed use, professional and service oriented offices, restaurants, vacation rentals, and wine tasting facilities. In order to try to balance the request of the applicant with the constraints of the neighborhood, there are recommended conditions of approval for the Planning Commission to consider. The uh, commercial use of the ground floor uh, would be restricted to retail and wine tasting as proposed. I mentioned the limiting wine tasting hours to 5 p.m. Continuing the ban on special events and live music that's in the 2018 use permit. And there's also additional requirements for on-site bike parking and for complimentary bikes for the vacation rental to try to address parking and uh, congestion in the downtown. We also have a requirement for a property management plan to govern how the rental would be managed and to help provide a point of contact for the neighbors to address concerns. In order for the Planning Commission to approve the project this evening, uh, findings need to be made for the use permit the adaptive reuse permit as well as the wine tasting use permit and I'll just take a second to run through them. For the use permit we have four findings that need to be made. One that the proposed use is consistent with the general plan and the specific plan. That the proposed use is allowed with a conditional use permit. The location size design and operating characteristics are compatible with existing and future land uses in the vicinity. The proposed use will not impair the architectural integrity and character of the zoning district. And then we have six additional findings for the adaptive reuse. Uh, what, what's being requested is that the 2018 adaptive reuse permit be amended, and that's really one of the topics of conversation this evening is how do we address this request that has not been before the Planning Commission before. The 2018 permit has been vested. It, obtained building permits and there's been building permit final for the entire building at this point. So the findings for adaptive reuse are does the project enhance, perpetuate, preserve, protect, and restore the historic districts, neighborhood sites, structures, and zoning districts which contribute to the aesthetic and cultural benefit of the city? Stabilize and improve the economic value of historic districts, neighborhoods, sites, structures, and zoning districts? preserve diverse architectural design reflecting phases of the city's history and encourage design styles and construction methods and materials that are compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. Promote and encourage continued private ownership and utilization of structures now so owned and used. Substantially comply with the applicable Secretary of the Interior's standards and guidelines for the treatment of historic properties. And there's a final finding that is required for the adaptive reuse for a vacation rental, and that is to restore and rehabilitate a historic structure and or property, excluding second units, which is listed or eligible for listing on the State Register of Historic Places that has fallen into such a level of disrepair that the economic benefits of the adaptive reuse are necessary to stem further deterioration, correct efficient conditions, or avoid demolition as implemented in the conditions of project approval. I think the commission is fairly uh, familiar with the wine tasting use permit findings of approval, so I won't uh, dwell on those, but we're really looking for, the, the question comes down to are there potentially sensitive or incompatible uses, and, uh, and um, 
architecture. There's not, no changes to the architecture. Uh, so staff has provided recommendation and resolution to support approval of the project and also has provided alternative recommendations for discussion of the Planning Commission. The first recommendation is to approve the project as, as proposed and also the number two option is to recommend modifications or to provide direction to staff to deny the, the amendment to the use permit or a council commission discretion. So staff's available for questions. Okay, thank you. Before we uh, move to staff questions, I'll pose my uh, now perennial question on applications, which is if any members of the commission have had ex parte communications with interested parties uh, on this project, now would be the opportunity to disclose those conversations, yeah. which should include generally who you met with, the general topic of conversation, and whatever else that you feel the other members of the commission and the public would like to know about your conversation. I have spoken with Jim Bohar about a month ago uh, regarding the neighborhood. He's not an interested party. Okay. I've met with Tom Thornley on two separate occasions. The first was following the Sonoma League for Historic Preservation Award uh, ceremony where I briefly spoke to you. And the second time was up at the property on Brazil Avenue that you're working, that Tom's working on. And we did discuss this project briefly. Um, I have seen the property when it was on broker tour as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Barbos? Apparently not, since neighbors don't count. No, uh, my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and we have Mr. Ruderman on Zoom, do we not, Natalie? Yes, we do. Okay. My understanding that the definition of an interested party is a party with a financial interest in an application or a project. Now, if, if Mr. Ruderman is listening, he can correct me. I don't see there him on is. my screen. That that is correct. Can you not hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, that is correct. It, in, it includes people who have a financial interest as that term is defined in the Political Reform Act. So that would be individuals who own property within 500 feet um, of this site. So, so that it would also that include that neighbors within 500 feet. They would be correct. considered interested parties? Okay, correct. so I was wrong. Mr. Bohar does qualify. Okay. Well, I spoke with Jim Bohar yesterday, and he shared with me a number of uh, concerns that he had about this project. Um, and I can elaborate on those, but it's basically um, opposition to the, uh, the wine tasting and the, um, the vacation rental. Okay. Others? I spoke with Mr. Bohar, uh, I believe it was Monday, around the exact same topics, uh, his issues around neighborhood compatibility. And he introduced me to his neighbor, the gentleman here in the uh, brown blazer in front, whose name I'm forgetting, Michael Heflin. All right. And that is it. And I also had a conversation with Mr. Bohar in which he expressed his concerns about the project as a neighbor. Anyone else? Okay. Well, now we'll go back to uh, the uh, questions for staff regarding the staff report. Um, by the way, I, I asked that uh, I asked our uh, development director to have Mr. Ruderman present uh, at the meeting because I believe that there are potentially some issues uh, that require uh, a legal uh, analysis to be able to deal with some of these application requests. So. Keep in mind that we have our city attorney, land use attorney present, and uh, and uh, and you can ask him questions that come up in the discussion as well. Okay, um, any questions for staff on this by members? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm um, struggling to understand the discrepancy between the 2018 permit, um, in particular item C, which says no food shall be prepared, and I don't didn't see that on the condition for approval on this. And secondly, um, E, that says there will not be vacation rentals. So I'm wondering if the adaptive use clause was, was available in 2018, why it wasn't used, and how, do we, how can we resolve these? It, it was used, so that was the mechanism for the approval in 2018. So, um, but there, there are some conditions then 
there yeah. were there were conditions. I wasn't I wasn't there at the time. So my understanding for the the kitchen, the limitation on the kitchen is because it's not a commercial kitchen, so it was not uh, permitted through the county through environmental health services. And so, in order to use it for a commercial purpose, they need to go through additional permitting. Sure. Um, I guess it's, knowing now that the adaptive reuse was used in 2018, um, again, I'm questioning what's different now. Um, I, because I guess they I, want a vacation rental now. Yes, and, so they're asking for modifications yeah. to expand the uses on the lower floor to allow the wine tasting use permit and to allow the vacation rental on the upper floor instead of it being a primary residence. Mm -hmm. And then again, this, the preparation of food was explicitly called out in 2018, but it, I didn't notice it in um, in the new proposal. I, bel I don't think we have changed anything with there. I might have been moved down, but the there is a condition of approval that would require them to obtain all applicable permits. And so in order to use the kitchen, it's a health department issue. It's not a use permit issue. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Barbos? I find myself struggling to, to grasp the, um, the historical underpinnings for the adaptive reuse here. This isn't listed in any official registry, either state or, or local, is it? It is eligible for listing in the state as part of the train district. Eligible, but not listed. It's listed, lo it's listed locally. And where is that? On the, the city council adopted what year? The, the train district. Mm -hmm. 22. Okay. Did the train district. In 2022? I think so. So what was the historical underpinning for the adaptive reuse in 2018? It, there was a, an in, the analysis was based on the League for Historic Preservation survey in 2018. Which said what? That it is historic. So it's the, the way, and I'll let Jennifer comment on how it goes from there and what the differences are. It's more her area of expertise. So I, I did not look at the, the original um, application and, and, their, and how they applied it. My understanding is that prior to um, the city undertaking an actual survey and completion of the survey for the train historic district, um, the, the league had done the survey there's, sorry, I get them confused. I apologize in advance. Um, or the Historical Society. Um, did the original survey, and it's been done, so this was the cooperage um, in the past, um, used to make wine barrels, but then even prior to that, it was used um, for um, warehousing for the train station. Um, so that history was already established, and that would be my understanding is that's what they probably used, and the determination that it was eligible at that time for listing. Um, the ordinance itself has not changed in 2016. We did look that up to see if things had changed since then, um, but it is now um, a listed um, property. Is, is there any way to know what the commission was yeah. thinking when it previously said no short-term rentals. I, oh, uh, so I believe that the historic resource evaluation should be in the agenda packet. I'm double checking. And my under, I obviously was not there at the time, but the vacation rental ban had already taken place. And so my understanding, and I, I'm sure the applicant can comment too, and this is just historically how we handled projects at the time was if something wasn't allowed, we tried to specifically state it in the conditions of approval. So there have been numerous use permits that have had to come through the Planning Commission. One that comes to mind is the Velo, where it said there shall be no alcohol. And we've had numerous use permits where there were kind of restrictions that maybe didn't necessarily need to be there. My guess is just that the the culture at the time, we had the vacation rental ban that was enacted in, in 2017, and that you know the provision is to try to support housing and, and not vacation rentals. That's, but that's just my best guess. Okay, I have one Can last question. No. Uh, I have one last question, and that is, what is the current status of the city's allowing short-term vacation rentals. Are there any circumstances under which people get those, uh, putting the adaptive reuse to the side? 
So they're banned citywide. The existing permitted vacation rentals, we have a list. Some of them were legal nonconforming. Some of them obtained use permits. Those are allowed to continue provided they meet certain parameters. They have to maintain a business license, pay TOT. There's you know, 10 or 15 requirements. They are transferable um, from property owner to property owner. And then the, the only way to get a new one is really through the adaptive reuse provisions. Thank you. Okay, any other, we're in the questions section of the program, and would, not comments. If I could uh, just direct, so the, the DPR forms for the train district are in the agenda packet, if anyone is interested in seeing those. Okay, any other questions specifically for staff? No? Okay, um, then we will open this up for uh, public comment. Um, how many people are interested in speaking tonight? All right, we're going to give the applicant a little more time because there may be questions from the commission for the applicant. And in general, I would ask members of the public who want to address the commission to try to keep your uh, comments to three minutes. I'm not going to ask that the timer be used, but I will be watching. And if you start to go on too long, I'm going to interrupt you. But I don't like the timer. So um, uh, let's start the uh, public hearing. And uh, Mr. Ross. Good evening. I'd like to uh, present a brief uh, PowerPoint presentation, if possible. Excellent. Well, first off, um, I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity. I'm here on behalf of the owner, Leslie and Mac McGowan. I am the architect for the project. And um, before I um, make this presentation, I would like to thank this commission as well as the Design Review Commission and the uh, Sonoma League for Historic Preservation for all of its support for this project over the years. And um, we really um, believe this project has been a wonderful uh, addition um, now that it's complete and the construction's over to the neighborhood. And I'd like to provide a little bit of context and the spirit of this uh, request tonight. Um, our Michael Woods, uh, real estate land use attorney, is going to speak to the consistency with the development code. And Tom Thornley, the contractor for the project that did an excellent job for it, will uh, provide an overview of some of the complexities and the issues that were encountered during the construction process. But um, first of all, I'd like to address the notion that uh, Commissioner uh, Barbos raised about um, is this a historic building or not? And um, in 2018, um, uh, the owner uh, commissioned Juliana Inman, uh, architect and resource, uh, historic resource consultant for it. And there's an uh, HRE, historic resource evaluation, that was the basis of the 2018 uh, proposal. And that found, and I'm quoting here, that um, the HRE found the ice house building to be an altered vernacular two-story stone and wood frame building which exhibited good physical integrity and was eligible, quote, to retain its 1978 listing in the California Register of Historic Resources. So in that regard as a historic building, in addition to it being a major contributing factor to the uh, railroad historic district. Okay. So um, the reasoning for this application is during the construction period, the cost of the preservation and uh, of the project was considerable in time and money, totaling approximately $6 million above the other costs for the project. Uh, the award-winning outcome, however, was phenomenal. And the property is now for sale. And the goal of this uh, application is to 
partially offset the costs of preserving it that were encountered along the way. And there were issues that were totally unknown in 2018 that were discovered af afterwards during this construction period that if we would have known then what we know now, we probably would have asked for the um, wine tasting use permit as well as the um, vacation rental. So I know this is an odd thing to, to come back retroactively and ask you for this consideration, but it's really as a method to increase the uh, value potentially of the property to assist in its resale. And um, we believe that it's a modest um, change in use. It's all indoors. It's um, uh, probably in the most acoustically attenuated building uh, in Sonoma, these thick, thick stone walls. No outdoor use is being proposed. No food service is being proposed. And we see the upstairs uh, vacation rental actually being linked to who the potential owner of whoever the winery is, and that there's synergy between those two spaces. Okay? So I'm going to provide an overview. Some of this you may already know, so uh, please bear with me. In the 1900s, uh, the stone building that we um, now call the Ice House uh, was formerly known as the Cooperage. It was built in 1906, the stone building. The upper floor was not built until 1923. The upper floor is a wood frame, stucco clad uh, residence. At that point, there was living above and work below not unlike what we're, we're proposing here, the potential to live above and work below. Uh, the Ice House was, has been in continuous um, commercial use for approximately 114 years. It has been used as an ice manufacturing plant, a cooperage, a brewery, an armory, a U.S. Naval Training Center, a garage, and recently as an artist studio and bed and breakfast. Uh, the bed and breakfast was um, eventually shut down because it was an unreinforced masonry building. In 19, or excuse me, in 2014, a 6.0 uh, earthquake severely damaged this building, the Napa earthquake. We all remember it, and at this point, uh, the building actually needed rescue, more so than preservation and it was in danger of collapse should another earthquake come. The use was vacated and boarded up. It was temporarily shored and stabilized. And in 2018, uh, we requested the use permit and we thank you for approving that. And what we're asking you for now is for us to modestly expand that use permit. All other conditions of approval of the use permit remain unchanged, excepting for the indoor wine tasting use permit and the ability to have the vacation rental upstairs. So what are the complexities that we found along the way? Tom can speak to this a little later. But um, one of the first things that were discovered is that there is an artesian well that was under the structural slab. There was an event where the jackhammer fell through and almost the laborer too. It's 22 feet deep and it's filled with water. And we decided to preserve it. And it was a costly endeavor. And since this uh, is a public access first floor with the current use permit, we thought it would actually be something that would be unique, that people could understand that this building wasn't actually a cooperage like we all call it, but it was actually an ice making facility in the early 1900s. I still don't understand the magic of making ice uh, back then, but this was the well that provided the water 
and now it's on the preserved and on display uh, in the building. Other things that were discovered along the way were um, severely contaminated soils that needed to be um, uh, removed, abated, and cleaned, encapsulated. And a very complex seismic strengthening program. Couple this with COVID and the time stretched out, the costs went up, and um, the owner's idea about the project and her desire to retain it started to change. And now um, the building is uh, up for sale, but it leaves behind this legacy. This is uh, the space now after it's been retrofitted. This is the area that would be for the wine tasting room. This is uh, its location as a um, key anchor in the City of Sonoma Historic Train District. This is um, the building today. State Park on the side. And some of the after pictures of this um, really ambitious and fully committed uh, preservation of a historic building. So if you think about it, it's the private sector or nonprofits that are driving the preservation of historic buildings in Sonoma. And if this commission can assist the private sector to do it, I believe it is an excellent thing for all of us to consider because it takes a special type of owner who can actually um, acquire a building like this, invest very heavily in it, and leave behind good work like this. And just by adding two small uses, the wine tasting use and the vacation rental, it will improve the ability for this um, project to go on to the next owner and allow it to be part of the public domain where people can enjoy it, come in, have a glass of wine, and not disturb the neighbors. So I'm here asking your, um, your uh, with great respect for your decision here, because I know it's a, re a relatively complicated one, asking your approval of this uh, amendment to the change of the use permit. So uh, I'm available to um, answer any questions. And with that, I would like to introduce Michael Woods. Before we do that, let's uh, see if there's any questions for you. Mr. Barbos? Well, if we sort of look around town, it seems like we've had a lot of tasting rooms fall by the wayside. Not being in the wine business, I can only surmise that the cost of the plaza rents versus the income generated by the tasting room leads the owners to abandon the, as a commercial venture. So I'm just wondering, given all the money that's been put into this and the relatively small scale of this tasting room, how is this tasting room going to recoup any significant sums that uh, seemingly weren't available to all these people who have gone out of business? Right. Great question. In a way, what we're doing is describing an imaginary buyer right now. And we see this as would be a... Um, a trophy location for highlighting a brand and it's not necessarily about driving revenue out of that room. It's really about uh, anchoring the brand in, with quality, which this building is and this property is. And so I see it more about um, brand strengthening than driving revenue from glasses of wine or sales. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? I've got one. Um, I noticed in your survey of photographs uh, an outdoor swimming pool and what looks to be in the area that surrounds it. Um, is your applica application proposing that this area is not allowed to be used? That swimming pool is going to be associated with the residential uses on the property, which would be the uh, ADU and the upstairs unit. It, well, the ups when you say residential uses, are you, uh, are you saying that the pool would not be available to vacation rental guests? No, I'm not saying that. I'm, okay. sa I'm 
saying in that so, would so be... There is, so there is an outdoor potential for outdoor activities on this property would, at the commi pool. Commissioner Barnett, I actually would say that that is something that would need to be approved through the property management plan. And um, since I haven't been privy to what that might be, uh, but uh, currently I was going to say that the pool's associated with the residential uses. Okay, but but there, at present there is no residential use, and the resi and the ADU may end up being a residential use and have the use of the pool. But the upstairs of the unit is the future residential use being proposed now for vacation rental use in the meantime. So I, I'm just looking for clarity on what, in fact, the activity level on this property will be for up to six people and well and uh, and so I, you you're saying that that hasn't been defined yet I think it's a valid question and it hasn't been defined yet so f thank you for the question but uh, I'm sure that we can provide feedback on it or consider uh, a restriction on that use okay thank you mr. Barbos I'm sorry I forgot my other question that I wrote down it has to do with the artesian well, and um, it looks like the, the shaft of it was somehow reinforced or con concrete was put in that so you can, and, and lighting so you can look down in it, is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. Was there a um, sort of a less costly solution to what to do about the artesian well? Abandon it and backfill it part of concrete slab on top of it. Mm -hmm. and, and just in terms of price difference on those two, what do you estimate that was? I have no idea. Are we talking millions? No. 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 The, um, the, the, the total cost of um, the renovation is best addressed by Tom Thornley. Okay. Um, but the, um, the cost of cleaning up the soil, removing it, trucking it off very long distances, the testing, the seismic retrofit. Um, there is this is a very complicated project that required a lot of care, and it got it. Thanks. Okay. And uh, anyone else with a question? I've got one more. Um, you made the statement that um, you might have altered your proposed uses in 2018 if you knew then what you know now. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, I was trying to, uh, we didn't go for a wine tasting use permit because the use of the property at the time was uh, twofold. One, it was going to be the uh, second resident of, of uh, the owner, and downstairs was going to be a lifestyle retail shop. And so that was the desire of our applicant at the time. And but those um, that use has changed. She has changed her mind, and she now has decided to uh, sell the property. No, I understand that. Uh, my my question is, I guess I took as the implication of your comment that uh, it was that what you knew then versus what you know now was more related to the nature of the work that had to be done, not the not the choice lifestyle choices yes. of the property owner did I understand that's that correctly? exactly correct okay so then my follow-up question to that is when did you realize how expensive this project was actually going to be and why did the applicant not come forward sometime between now and six years ago to request a modification of the application because at some point in time you all went, my God, this project is costing 10 times what we thought it was going to be, or whatever it was. And, um, and so I'm, I'm wondering why, the, why now at the very end, when the building is completed and the rehabilitation completed and all this money spent, why now is it that the request for the, for the addendum or, or the change in the application now instead of earlier? I think that's a, a great question of the owner. Um, I, I could surmise that she was dedicated to completing the work and getting it done. 
um, so it could um, maximize the value of the property and also provide her an opportunity to say, should I stay or should I not stay? Uh, you know, there's private decision making that happens uh, with everybody, um, but uh, this decision wasn't made until after the project was over. I see. Okay, thank you. Yes. I have one follow-up question, as, you, you know, along the same lines, because as I look at the the breakdown of costs that was provided by the Thornley Construction, many of the costs are things that um, would logically be rolled into the first permit. You know, the seismic stabilization, a lot of the asbestos. So, um, I'm again, I'm I understand the COVID shutdown that was 50k, but um, I'm I'm just curious. You know, what percentage are we talking about here? You know, it, looked, it seems like a lot of the sunk costs were already known because of what was permitted and the request for that. So if you have any color on that, I'd appreciate it. I think um, the cost question should be addressed to Tom, who's available here tonight specifically. Um, but on a project like this, it's near impossible to uh, predict the future and um, or the levels of complexity that's associated with a old stone building. And so um, it's not surprising for me in today's marketplace to see um, the cost of construction double and um, like this one. And uh, it did. And, and now that it's for sale, if we can assist the um, sales to uh, offset some of these costs, that's why I'm here. And I, I really believe that uh, even with granting this um, uh, request, it's going to be a good neighbor. It's not going to be a, um, the type of uh, loud and rowdy restaurant or something. It's just quiet wine tasting inside of a large stone building. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Tom, did you want to come up? Or was Mr. Woods going to uh, precede you? Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Michael Woods. I'm an attorney representing the property owners. I live on First Street West. My office is at 846 Broadway here in town. Um, Commissioner Barnett, following up on one of your questions regarding the timing of the decision making on the project, there were truly unforeseen conditions that came about during construction. One of those was discovering oil. Not a good thing in this context. We found out that there had been a uh, uh, dry cleaning plant um, j not far from the property to the south in the early part of the 20th century, and there had been a fuel oil driven boiler just across the property line that leaked. And so we found hydrocarbons in the water and brought in the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Once you're under their jurisdiction, you're not going to stop the project and come to the Planning Commission, frankly, and ask for an amendment to the use permit. You really couldn't have done that at that time. There was a need to approach the remediation in a way that was consistent with the Water Board's jurisdiction, and, and that's what we did at, at very considerable cost. During some of the soils remediation efforts, I recall that the rear building was actually elevated several feet into the air and put on blocks and then chained back to the earth in order to prevent it from blowing away. I mean, these kinds of circumstances came up during construction and Tom knows about those better than I do. But I guess I would just point out that there were sort of a cascading range of issues that came up on the project during construction that ultimately led the owner to change course. The reason why there was no discussion about a use permit for wine tasting or for a vacation rental in 2018 was because that wasn't part of the owner's plan. As Michael indicated, Mac and Leslie were planning to make this a second residence here in the valley. Um, they had their own plans. Leslie had her own plans for a lifestyle store on the ground floor. And I think this cascading range of events that occurred during construction affected their decision as to whether they wanted to continue owning the property or not. They reached the decision that they would not. I don't think that the use permit for the tasting room is going to be a an economic driver in the sense of how much money would sales produce from a given tasting. I think the closest parallel to this, at least in my experience, is the Vallejo Castaneda Adobe 
that was approved under the adaptive reuse provisions for an historic structure uh, back, I think it was in 2012, 2013. And at that time we had 25 or 30 neighbors who were very opposed to the project. They were concerned about potential for noise, potential for parking issues. Uh, they were concerned, I think, that the operation of a tasting room on the north side of West Spain Street adjacent to Girl and the Fig that they'd had issues with over the years would be replicated by three sticks at the Vallejo Castaneda Adobe. And that wasn't the case. <clears throat> Since that project was approved, consistent with the adaptive reuse findings, I think there's been one neighbor that's expressed concerns over the years. Um, hard to avoid uh, something like that on occasion. But by and large, the conditions of approval that allowed investment in that property, saving that adobe from ruin, that allowed private tastings by appointment only, strictly controlled and regulated, has worked. The building was preserved and the, the, the property has operated as more of a, I think, and I don't, I'm not speaking for the owners at this point, but I think more as a branding <clears throat> kind of an exercise and kind of a lifestyle choice where someone that's interested in those wines also has a destination location to go for a special occasion for a wine tasting. So it's, it's not what drives the economics of an individual glass being poured or a bottle being sold. It's much more organic, I would expect, in the context of, of a brand uh, overall. Um, so I looked at the findings in the staff report for compliance with the adaptive reuse ordinance. I thought they were well drafted and compelling. I think we meet all of the findings and obviously it's in the commission's discretion to determine that, but I think you've got a solid situation here with the conditions of approval to where you can approve this consistent with the adaptive reuse findings. I think it's important too to consider just briefly what signal do we send to property owners who are involved in historic renovation or restoration in the city of Sonoma. If you're in a project and you're trying to get it done, perhaps you're hoping that you would be able to come back to the commission at some point and say, look, an amendment would be appropriate here and would help us recoup some of our costs that we expended on an extraordinarily expensive project. I don't think we wanna send the signal that you should shut the project down until you come in and see what approvals you can get because that suggests that you're not gonna complete the historic restoration. And I don't think that's a signal that we wanna send. So I would recommend, obviously on behalf of the owner and request that you move forward with approval. Happy to answer any questions if I can. Yeah, I've got one, I have two. Um, are, you, are you implying that this property has become a financial hardship to the owner? Yes. You are? I am. And, and so does that open the door to a discussion of the financial condition of the owner? No. Well, you, I don't think anybody, despite their level of wealth. wealth, is going to make imprudent decisions regarding investment in real estate. I've represented many, many wealthy owners of real estate in the Sonoma Valley and Napa Valleys, and I have not found them to be um, loose with their change, I so understand, to speak, but because it's simply not reasonable from a business judgment. I think but, here's but a- But you don't believe that this the city's responsibility to ensure that a speculative project, no matter what it costs, is the responsibility of the city to solve for a given property owner, are you? Well, I think the city does have a responsibility to encourage private investment in real property in order to restore and preserve an historic resource. I think that's part of the city's objectives from a land use perspective and part of the reason why we have an historic adaptive reuse provision in our development code in the first place. No, of course, Commissioner or Chairman Barnett, I'm not suggesting the city is responsible for the financial condition of the property owner, but I do believe that it's in the city's best interest to send signals to property owners involved in preserving historic structures that contribute to historic districts in any way that they reasonably can. Obviously, you need to make the findings and grapple with the individual facts of the particular case, but I think from an overall policy perspective, that's a wise course. Okay, and um, uh, I guess that's it for the moment. Anybody else have questions for Mr. Woods? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Thornley, you're on. Okay, my name's Tom Thornley, live at 716 2nd Street East. I've kind of written down what I need to say here, uh, not quite as 
good on the fly as these other two guys. Uh, suffice it to say this was a very difficult, very expensive, and very robust seismic retrofit and restoration. However, tonight I want to focus my comments on two surprises we encountered during the process. We started the project, the building was yellow tagged because of the severe structural damage from the Napa earthquake. There was a crack in the front wall that you could put your hand through. The front of the building was held up by temporary emergency shoring. It was in danger of falling down. Almost immediately after we started, we dug test holes around the perimeter of the foundation per request from our structural engineers to determine if the stone walls were sitting on any type of foundation and if not, how deep did the stone extend below grade? The day after the test pits were dug, we noticed a black oily substance on the top groundwater at the bottom of the holes. We immediately called the hazmat geologist and had it tested. It turned out to be crude oil and fuel oil. We immediately contacted the Bay Area Regional Water Quality Board opened an investigation and mapped out a mitigation plan. Based on the HRE, we knew the building at one point was an ICE manufacturing facility, the Bose Ice and Storage Company. Before refrigeration was invented, the only way to get ice was to manufacture it or go up in the mountains and get it out of the mountains. The manufacturing process was invented in France in the late 1800s and required very large steam-driven equipment that fused ammonia and other chemicals with the water to make the ice. The steam-driven equipment was powered by crude oil and fuel oil. Fuel oil is crude oil refined once. It's basically still a crude oil. Over the years, the fuel pipes leaked, eventually rusted away, and leaving plumes of contaminated soil around and under the building. A mitigation protocol plan was put in place that required us to have a geologist on site every time we did any ground disturbing activity. And the soil had to be tested, the extent of the con con contamination dictated, what toxic landfill the spoils had to be hauled to. Some of it had to go to Nevada, it was so hot. Uh, some of it went to Kettleman's Hills uh, here in California, and then some of it was deemed to go to Sol the Solano, Solano County landfill. This was an extremely costly labor-intensive, heavily regulated procedure that went on throughout the entire project. By the time we were able to get the final sign-off from the Water Quality Board, we had off 410 tons of hazmat soil. That's enough to fill this room. And it was done throughout the project. It didn't, every time a shovel went in the ground, so this was right up into landscaping where we're having this testing done. Uh, uh, the second surprise that occurred within a couple of months of the hazmat soil discovery, in the early demolition phase of the project, uh, we were removing the concrete floor on this side of the building. The slab was being cut up into 12 in, or 24 inch by 24 inch pieces broken apart with a 90 pound jackhammer, loaded onto a handcart, and then loaded into a dump truck in the driveway. Early one morning, the jackhammer operator was breaking out four two by two squares at a time. Suddenly the floor gave way and all four pieces plummeted into a dark hole and landed with a big splash. The operator let go of the 90 pound hammer and leaped off to the side. We were all stunned to discover the dark hole was actually a rock lined functioning artesian well. 
we, we immediately reported the find to PRMD. Uh, we were told to file a well abandonment permit and fill it with concrete. Leslie McClown <laughs> couldn't bear the idea of doing that. So she decided she wanted to save it as a rare piece of Sonoma history and turn it into a functioning archeological art installation. And that's what it is today. Over the next several months, Thornley Associates, Associates negotiated with the Water Quality Board and PRMD to save the well. Eventually, after pumping out the artesian well twice and having it tested for pollutants, the water tested clean both times. We were granted permission to save it. Based on historic photos, we know the well existed in 1887, but speculated it could date back to the Spaniards in the early 1800s. At a great expense, the well was successfully saved, lit, ventilated, an overflow installed, and had a one-inch glass floor installed over it. Personally, I think the discovery of this well was one of the most significant archaeological finds in this town's history. The water from this well was the source of the ice that changed this town dramatically. Sonoma was primarily a quarry town, but the Bose Ice and Storage Company changed that by allowing the shipment of wine, produce, and dairy products by rail. The town is what it is today, largely due to the water from this well. I encourage the Planning Commission to approve this proposed use in order to broaden the access to this historically significant building and to this very significant archeological uh, find. And I am open to questions about numbers, uh, the process, what it, whatever. Okay. Uh, commissioners, anyone have a question? Mr. Barbos. Can you push your button real quick? Thank you. Um, roughly, how much additional cost was incurred in, in creating what is there now, which sounds very interesting and, and beautiful, yeah. but how much did that cost versus just filling it in the way the county first wanted you to do? The, you, on the well, you're talking about the, the just well. the well itself. Just the well. I would guess the well was probably is well, certainly was in six figures to save it. It, it was. It could have been probably. I would think 150 to 200 thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Interesting thing about this well is it was initially dug in the 1800s, and then when Bose bought the property, he improved the well. So when we first found the well, we looked down the hole, there were four pieces of concrete laying there that had fallen into it, and a jackhammer. So we retrieved that. We had to get OSHA protocol set up to go into an enclosed space and pull the four pieces of concrete out. Well, we had read in the HRE that Bose had improved the well. Well, as it turns out, under these four pieces of concrete, were, was a intact redwood barrel. And that redwood barrel sat in a hand-carved bell-shaped chamber. So the well initially was four to five feet of adobe lined with rocks, an impermeable surface. Then it was about probably 15 feet of gravelly hard pan. Well, when Bose came in, they went down and hand chiseled it out so that the when the bell when the well charges the water flows down the side goes into the bell and the sediments filtered out when it goes through the cracks in the barrel it's cowboy engineering at its best and saving it was cowboy <laughs> engineering at its best and as far as i know we, I know there have been other wells found in this town, hand dug wells, 
A lot of them have been abandoned, filled up. As far as I know, this is the only one that's ever been saved. And it's crystal clear water, oddly enough. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question Matt? specifically about the well, Tom. Do you recall when in the project's timeline that well was discovered? Yeah, like it was first... almost immediately after we, probably within two months of us discovering the contaminated test pits. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Further, anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Thornley. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm sure you're all anxious to speak. I am going to call for a five-minute recess because I'm an old man with an old bladder.
like to bring the meeting back to order, please. Take your seats and uh, bring your full attention. Okay, now we're going to uh, open this up for public comment. Let me suggest, given the uh, number of hands I saw raised, that if you have something new to add to what's been said, of course you're welcome to come up, and you're welcome to come up if you want to repeat something that someone has said. But another option is, because if there's ten of you we could go through another thirty minutes of this, at three minutes each, is as someone is speaking, if you agree with what they have to say, just silently raise your hand. Uh, this may reduce, in general, the total number of people who want to speak and the repetition of points, uh, but nonetheless afford the Commission the opportunity of getting a sense of what public opinion is. So, um, if you would like to speak, please come up to the lectern, give your name and your address so that if this matter continues to future meetings, the city knows where to contact you. And um, as I say, I'm not going to use the timer, but I, I will be sort of listening and watching the clock. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, I'm ready. Hello to the commissioners. My name is Christine Bohar. I have lived at 299 First Street West for over 40 years. I know all of my neighbors and their children. I have also watched the residential neighborhood grow quite a bit. Eight new, resi eight new residents, and including two historic renovations since I've been there. All this within the, a block of the Cooperage. In May of 2018, I was one of many neighbors that spoke in favor of the adaptive restoration and reconstruction of the Cooperage with certain conditions. The buildings would be renovated historically and that the use would be residential with a small, quote, homeware store on the ground floor and the barn would be for a caregiver unit. The neighbors were thrilled. We endured five years of construction, noise and disruption that resulted with two handsome and well done buildings for us to admire and for that we're thankful. Six years after the original approvals were granted, the owners are coming back to the Planning Commission requesting permits for additional and unanticipated uses. Unsuspe unspecified wine tasting use, VRBO with the short term vacation rentals, and some undefined retail. Now that the owners have decided not to live in the building as originally approved, they want to recoup their expenses by changing the uses of the building. We see that as creeping commercial and retail intrusion into our residential community. This would change the character of our charming street. The additional traffic, noise, deliveries, etc., would be more than this section of First Street West can comfortably enjoy. If I had known, oh, I've heard this before. If I had known this was what the owners wanted in 2018, I would have been against it then just as I am now. Our street needs more residential, not more VRBOs, entertainment, and wine tasting venues. Please deny the applicant's request. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, just come right up. Set my, own timer. my name is Steve Weisiger. I reside at 227 First Street West. I live next door to the Depot restaurant. I feel that I have a somewhat unique perspective being directly next to a restaurant. Three disturbing things I heard tonight were, were reinventing history, an imaginary buyer, and I also heard people be little, this, this won't be a hectic, busy, noisy thing. Listen, those hours that were listed on, throw them out the window. 7.30, there'll be leaf blowing. You're going to have delivery trucks which have backup alarms. You're going to be hearing all kinds of activity. I've been involved with this property. I've lived here. I moved away. Now I live here again since 90, 91. 
the first incident that I witnessed was the renter coming out and screaming at the depot for dumping bottles at 11 p.m. at night. And this was an early riser. You are going to hear wine bottles throughout the day dumped into a garbage. You're going to hear rolling thunder twice a week as the dumpster is moved. We, we had renters complain to the city to get the dumpster moved in the back. Well, the back smells now. The back is noisy. Twice a week, they roll it out to the street. Unbelievable. They're constantly doing renovations. Now, th these are good neighbors. These are good people. You can talk to them. They'll listen to your complaints. But I, I have to desensitize myself. I'm the kind of guy who wants to identify every noise. But I really empathize with anyone who's going to be living next to something that starts to expand. Selfishly, I have to drive up and down this street. On Friday, uh, Ochoa, I don't know how you pronounce it, had a event truck in front for two hours, closing this street down to a single lane. This street is like a game of Frogger. I'm dodging people constantly. So for me, this, this should not be taken lightly. If, if somebody here lives next to a restaurant, you get it. If you don't, you don't get it. You don't get that, some, that, that contractors and others, they show up as early as they can to get their job done. Workers, not knowing, they're just excited to be there at 6.30 a.m. to open up, and they're just loud talking. Meanwhile, my bedroom window's open because it's hot, and I don't have air conditioning. So, you know, this, this is not to be taken lightly. And in terms of no events, I think Verbo, I think a short-term rental, each time an occupant takes uh, charge of a 2,500 square foot place, they're, it's like an event. They're going to be noisy. They're going to be using the pool. A pool is a megaphone. You're going you're gonna to hear that noise. So for me, please don't downplay the intensity that something like this causes. Uh, I, I understand that you want to get your costs back. There's also, I do my own taxes. When I make mistakes, the government gives me all kinds of places to write things off. I don't understand why the city has to step up other than this was a beautiful art project and then we're coming later to ask permission and forgiveness to get these costs back. All because they fell out of love with it. They don't want to live here anymore. And that makes me sad. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up. Hello. My name is Carrie Fogg. I live at 291 First Street West, and I'm one of the neighbors of this project. Um, in 2018, as we all know, they received their first permit. Now it's 2024, and they're coming back to the Planning Commission requesting for additional and unanticipated use as a wine tasting room, short-term rental, and some unspecified retail. I don't know what that would be. Their extensive and very expensive restoration and construction took nearly five years to complete. Although it may seem to make sense to the owners to recoup some of their enormous investment in the project, and since they now don't plan to reside there, we neighbors see it as creeping commercial and retail development into our small, single-family residential neighborhood. The finished product is a beautifully executed and lovely restoration of this historic Old Stown Cooperage building. We all love passing that building every day as we come home. Um, but where am I? <laughs> we see it as a overreaching, permitted usage and would change the character of, the, of our charming street. The additional traffic, parking problems, and anticipated noise would be more than this se section of First Street West can com comfortably accommodate. We enjoy the vibrancy and, and activity of our location here, but we do not want to live adjacent to what we resemble a busy hotel and entertainment venue. I urge you to carefully consider this example of how the continuing proliferation of tasting rooms and short-term rentals is eroding the character of our neighborhoods. Please vote no on this project. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next up. Go 
You can queue up a little bit if it'll, if you're inclined. Hello, my name is Michael Heffler. I'm the I'm the new guy on the block. We've only been here three and a half years. I'm at 293 First Street West, and I want to firstly thank all of you for your service to the community. I've done a few of these where I've spoken to different. Uh, townships people and I always appreciate the fact that you guys are volunteering to, to help out the town so thank you for that and thank you for consideration in this matter the three capable intelligent men that are employed by the McCowans um, did a very nice job in describing a lot of different things there but the thing that was interestingly avoided was that pool that pool is going to be the place where whoever buys the, you know, puts in a wine tasting there and has their friends over are going to be out at night waking up my grandchildren when they come over to sleep. It's very straightforward. I don't think anyone can imagine them not having friends and having parties at that pool. Um, I certainly can't imagine that. Uh, the the property is a, a, a lovely property, but our neighborhood is a lovely neighborhood. We wake up every day to birds singing. We wake up every day to looking out the backyards and seeing a beautiful place. We don't want to disturb the kind of noise that was just described very aptly uh, here. So I would strongly urge you to look at it from the point of view is, is this what I would want as one of my neighbors? when you're making your decision and say no to this property. The McCowans have the right to change their mind. They certainly do, but they've got a lot of money. So making a little more money for them would be a nice thing for them, but it wouldn't make any difference in their lives. To us, this would make a huge difference to all our lives. So again, I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, sir. Who's next? Good evening, I'm Carol Heffler. I live at 293 First Street West. Michael and I have lived there, as he said, for three and a half years. And I love our neighborhood. I love our house. And I love the quiet. I'm just going to make this short. When I think of what could possibly be in the cooperage, it really troubles me. Nobody's, nobody tastes wine silently. Nobody lives in a rental and doesn't say a word. Nobody goes to a pool quietly. Please vote no. Thank you. Nina Sastapati, um, 287 First Street West. How do you spell your last name? S-W-U-S-D-I-P-A-N-E-E. -E. I would like to uh, the commission to consider the realistic um, possibility um, of what would happen um, at the Cooperage if you do permit their um, application. There is no, um, it's just, the pool area is gonna be used for wine tasting, as you know, in, real, in reality. And the comparison to three sticks, the Castaneda Adobe adoption, is unfair because um, there, there's no pool, there's no overnight guests, and the applicant is still operating the business. Currently, the current owner is selling the property, so we don't know who um, is coming to the owner. And when 36 applied for their um, use permit, you did know who was there, and they are still operating it. And I would like you to reconsider the, a the application to put in restrictions, at the very least, of what they can do at the property. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for letting us comment on this. Uh, my name's Tom Dunlap. Um, I own the Swiss Hotel 
and I own all the property across the street from this project. My daughter and my grandchildren live at 298 First Street West. Um, my sister lives at 340 uh, First Street West and also has the duplex there. And um, I, we also uh, restored two historic buildings and I understand the problems with that and the unintended consequences. I restored the Swiss Hotel in uh, uh, 1989 to 1992, and I restored the house on 298 First Street West, which is a historic building, in uh, 2016. <clears throat> the issue that I have with this project is, and I, I think it turned out nice, it looks, it looks good, um, is again the issue of business creep. Um, this is a neighborhood. You have people that are very committed to supporting this neighborhood and enjoy the quality of life here. And the more we let business move into this neighborhood, uh, the more it's going to disrupt that. The, this neighborhood's already committed itself to a lot of uh, activities that happen in the town relative to Arnold Field, the Field of Dreams, um, and the Veterans Building that creates a lot of traffic and noise and disruption and it, it everybody understands that's part of living in this neighborhood but i don't think that we need to have more business just moving further and further up and intruding into the areas between the homes so i would hope that you would consider that and uh, vote no on this amendment thank you sir next up Yes, before I get started, let me hand something out here. Uh, let me give you one hand. Uh, I did submit some uh, comments. Uh, excuse me. I did submit some comments. My Victor Conforti, <coughs> 206 East Spain Street. I submitted some comments uh, uh, earlier. I guess you got those. And they were focused on uh, the uh, aspect of the of the uh, state uh, listings, whether it was uh, uh, f whether that's the path I guess that would be used to uh, support the project. So I've kind of gone off on a on a, a more general uh, comments, <coughs> and mainly uh, just wa again wanting to thank the my friends. <laughs> My and Tom, builders and ar ex super architect for decades. We've known one another, and the wonderful job that you did. And I can imagine, <laughs> only imagine the problems that occurred. Sorry, uh, <laughs> the uh, and also <laughs> Christina, who did a wonderful report, taught me something. I always l I learn a new thing every day. Uh, but tonight I wanted to uh, sort of focus on the. The neighborhood issue. Uh, that I think is an a important in, uh, issue in general with a community like Sonoma. We have uh, something here that's so precious that you can't uh, duplicate this anywhere. Or we have a f committed community, committed citizens who, like yourselves, who spend a huge amount of hours on numerous nonprofits and cultural things and other other use that that uh, really requires a full-time resident to do uh, a vacation rental obviously eliminates a potential neighbor for for these people who've been speaking it would be a part of their neighborhood would would be uh, supportive of uh, the goals, in fact, uh, one of the uh, provisions for the adaptive reuse uh, findings, one of the findings is, uh, the first finding is that uh, these uh, alterations or adaptive reuse would enhance and perpetuate neighborhoods. That's a fairly uh, important part of this uh, discussion, I think the, uh, I think the proposed use t 
today is the uh, is not going to enhance and perpetuate uh, the neighborhood. It does have too many impacts. It's 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 more intense than the original proposal. It's it has uh, you know uh, side effects that aren't obvious at first, as they have been pointed out here tonight. But uh, the s more subtle thing is this uh, aspect of uh, people who who want to have a neighborhood that includes other owners, property owners who live there like they do, and will join in with them to uh, create a neighborhood. So the, this is a hard thing to quantify. Uh, I do, as you know, I've been a real estate developer myself over the decades, and uh, I don't think you can be certain that the, uh, a buyer would be interested in this property because of its uh, return on investment. I would guess that, uh, that the, uh, an owner who is not making decisions based on return on investment when they buy something, they're looking at a home, a special place, special location, and they want to live there, uh, and they will pay whatever it takes <laughs> if they have the resources. Uh, so this may not be a, the, uh, the fact that the uh, a uh, commercial use is a, will outperform in terms of the actual sale price. But the, uh, the important thing really is the community benefits and which, which uh, proposal supports that. So thank you. Thank you. My name is Mary Smith, and I live at 154 West Spain Street. And I just want to make a comment about the Three Sticks Winery. They very, very frequently have big black limousines come, drop people off, park in front of the driveway. Makes it very difficult to get out at, at where I live. And I've had encounters like that numerous times. So when you say, a winery is not a problem. I would have to disagree. Thank you. How many more have comments they'd like to make? Come up, please, sir. Hello, my name's Peter Mathis. I live at 287 First Street West. That's two houses to the north of the Cooperage or Ice House. Um, I've lived there for quite a while, tw so over 20 years. I've had many a meal in the cooperage itself with the previous owners. Um, they were good neighbors and friends of uh, many of us there in the neighborhood, the wagers, Ken and Claudia. Um, I'm here to ask you to deny both of the expanded um, expansions to the use or changes. I am not in favor of seeing um, wine tasting rooms keep colonizing into neighborhoods. And that would be the case here. I mean, we have some right down at the end of First Street, or right at the plaza, but this is too much, in my opinion, and will impact me directly. The other one is the, um, and, and I'm just against it in principle, and I'm in the wine business, by the way. At, you know, but enough is enough. There's plenty of vacant places to 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 be rented for tasting rooms on the plaza itself. Um, I also am against ex uh, allowing for the vacation rental process. These people, like was previously said, it it denies us the possibility of an of a permanent neighbor. Um, People that do VRBOs, rental, or that type of things are notoriously noisy and disrespectful to neighborhoods. No matter what conditions you you write to them 
for that property, they will never see that condition. <laughs> They're going to do what they always do, which is make a lot of noise and splash in the pool and get drunk and go party, you know, have big parties when they say there's only two people there, they have 20. Okay, that's, we all know, we read about that. Okay, so um, I am sympathetic that the owners have spent a, you know, a gobsmacking amount of money on this project. Uh, Mr. Ross said right, right at the beginning that when you go into a project like this, you, ha it's, you have no idea what you're really getting into. He said he was not at all surprised that the cost doubled. Okay, that's, that's the way it is. And the owners of this property are both wealthy and savvy by all accounts. So I think they reasonably could have anticipated the risk of up the downside risk of the costs getting very high to me they're now asking us the community to essentially help them avoid the moral hazard that they had with this project so i urge you to um, not approve this change thank you thank you sir Anyone else? It's working well. I'm Jim Bohar. I live at 299 First Street West. Good evening, commissioners and staff. I live right next door to the uh, Cooper Ice House. The ice house received a conditional use permit in May of 2018. A personal pied -a for the owner, Leslie McQuan. Limited retailing of personally selected items. Security apartment in the rear because of their concern for uh, safety. Members and I attended those planning commission meetings. I was there, several of my neighbors are there. Our concerns were included in the conditions of approval, including the prohibition against VRBOs, and including no food to be served to the public. That was not an accident. That was an agreement by the Planning Commission to insert those in the conditions of approval. During construction, it took about five years, the owner chose not to live in the property but sell it. High construction spending led to a $12 million selling price. It didn't sell at $12 million. It was reduced to 7.9, and it's been there for some time, perhaps, a year, I'm, I don't know. I don't know when it was put on the market. Now attempting to add commercial value by changing the com to commercial uses. The new application is termed an amendment to the original permit. An amendment is a minor change or improvement, perhaps a clarification. This is not that. This is a major change in use. It will have a detrimental effect by allowing creeping commercialism into our neighborhood. It will set a commercial precedent. The applicant requests continued retail, wine tasting, an ADU, a VRBO, as I said, previously prohibited. There are really six potential usable bedrooms and a newly added swimming pool, which was not part of the first uh, CUP. It was added later, it has a permit, but it's never been mentioned in the, uh, in the narrative here. But it's, as we talked, it's going to be a wonderful outdoor recreation center for the, for the guests in the, in the two rentals. Wine tasting usually adds food pairing. And I mentioned the previously prohibited use of food. Shared use of wine tasting and retail use uh, is wanted, but we don't specify the, the sizes. It's 2,500 feet. That's a very large space. It describes a vague use of the VRBO associated with proposed wine tasting, which is rather hard to understand that relationship. No solution is given to the additional needed parking. The owners, under their original permit, have already received the incentive and benefit from the adoptive reuse section of the code. They have the responsibility for the large amount of money spent. They've received other concessions, including a large parking waiver, a negative declaration under CEQA. 
This project appears to nullify that negative declaration because of significant impacts on our neighborhood context. We want more housing, not retail in our neighborhood. I have some interesting information I hope I can share with you. I learned that uh, shortly ago that ammonia is actually a gas used in ice process. It dissipates. It, it will kill people, but only while you're making ice. It goes away. It's not in the soil. I looked further into that because I was, I was questioning it. I've done over 250 deals as an industrial broker that have contamination of this type. I hired a... I hired an uh, environmental consultant, Amicus Strategic Environmental Consulting. I got the report two days ago. There are no toxic substances in that soil. The cleaning establishment was to the south. It was nearby, but there's no cleaning solvents in that soil. There is um, only heating oil that is used to heat those kinds of warehouses and manufacturing plants. The heating oil is not a toxic substance. It's not what they call a VOC, a volatile organic compound. It does not leave the soil. As a matter of fact, the report that I have states that that heating oil soil could have been left in place and not removed. The only reason it was removed is because the deep footings that the uh, construction people felt had to, be, had to be dealt, had to be dug, and they took out the soil to make room for the footings. That, that soil you could call dirty, but it was not toxic, and it didn't have to be taken away. It was taken to another dump that takes dirty soil. The cost of that uh, soil it was about 20% more than if they just dumped it in a, in a dump somewhere. Very little cost. Furthermore, those reports started out, it's called a phase one investigation, started on August 21st, 2018. A couple of months after that permit, everyone was aware that there were problems in that soil. You can identify the quantity, the kind, by doing what's called a phase two environmental investigation. It's on file here. I suppose it, I suppose it points out all those details. So I would be, I'd be glad to share this report with you. It has, it has reference to all these uh, reports. I'd also like to comment about the ice business. If you walk over to the try, rail car. Try to wrap it up. Yes. The history of ice is over in the uh, rail car with the historic preservation people. Ice was used for local transportation of produce to the city. They tried ice in refrigerator cars for a year or two, but it didn't work. It melted. They had to wait for the reefers to be invented to carry produce across the country. So it's not such a, ice is not such a big uh, historical event. It's not shocking. It's not something we have to preserve. And I'm sorry to get so wound up, but I am. I'm, I'm very concerned about this project impacting my neighborhood. Again, like my neighbors, I want neighbors. I don't want retail and, and VRBOs and wine tasting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, unless there is anyone else, I will bring the, oh, please come up. Patricia Cullinan, Denmark Street. I just want to clarify something. This was not the original ice plant in Sonoma, where Vela's is. The train stopped there, they got their water there, and they picked up ice. This is a later addition of an ice plant in Sonoma. I just want to correct the record. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Going once, going twice, three times. I will now close the public hearing. Mr. Chair, if I can interrupt, this is for city staff. Can we get the AC running again? I know there's a lot of emotion in this room, but I think that my uh, temperature level is not. <laughs> hey. Um, at this time, um, uh, Ms. Gates, I want to direct some questions on the legal issues to our attorney, Mr. Ruderman, if he is still with us. Is he still with us? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. 
Great. Good evening, David. I'm sure you're finding this interesting. Um, I've got some questions that will inform at least my deliberations about this going forward that has to do with some legal issues. Um, uh, in 1999, I was the member of the City Council who proposed a ban on vacation rentals in residential zones. And uh, it was uh, an experience that I'd had in uh, Carmel, California that prompted me to do that. Um, that uh, ordinance was passed, as I say, in 1999 and has been in effect in the City of Sonoma for a long time. At the time it was passed, it allowed vacation rentals in commercial districts, but it was an absolute ban on vacation rentals in residential zones. So my question for you is this. Um, uh, given that prohibition, given the language in the reuse ordinance that would seem to permit it, how does one resolve the legal conflict between a true and existing ordinance in the city of Sonoma banning vacation rentals in residential zones and now everywhere else, um, and a reuse uh, uh, ordinance that it would appear allows it as an option with the approval of the Planning Commission? Well, normally we try to interpret all provisions of the code such that they are consistent. Um, we do not like to imply repeal of other provisions. Um, so we presume that the council, when they adopted the vacation rental ban in its current incarnation, understood that there was an existing provision related to vacation rentals as a, a condition of an adaptive reuse permit. And so the way that I would reconcile those two is that vacation rentals, new vacation rentals are banned um, in all situations except for upon approval by the Planning Commission of an adaptive use permit. And there are, there's actually a special finding, I believe, that uh, Ms. Tierney identified that is required in order for the Planning Commission to approve a vacation rental as a condition of an adaptive reuse permit. Is there not also a uh, legal precedent that when two, uh, when there's a conflict between regulations and ordinances, that the defer, that one defers to the more stringent ordinance? Uh, the rule is that, um, it, well, first of all, if we're, we're not talking about a conflict between an ordinance and a regulation, um, normally a regulation is subservient to an ordinance, like a resolution would be subservient to an ordinance. We're talking about what you are identifying as a potential conflict between two ordinances. Yes. Normally, in, yeah, and in those cases, yes, one of the canons of construction is that the more, not the more restrictive, but the more specific um, applies. And actually, there may be even a provision in our code that talks about the more restrictive applying. There is. Yeah. Based on my reading. Okay, so um, uh, that, that was one of my legal questions. My second question has to do with the granting of permits under the premise of an adaptive reuse. As I read the ordinance that pertains to adaptive reuse, it basically allows for these other uses in order to preserve a building in danger of collapse or other threatening conditions. And it is to help to compensate potentially for the um, cost of the preservation under adaptive reuse that there is a consideration of granting other permitted uses for a property. Do I understand that correctly? 
I think the question you're asking is how tight of a nexus do you need between the rehabilitation of a structure and its use as listed within the adaptive use? Um, well, to an extent I am. I mean, I, I think that it's clear that in 2018, when the adaptive reuse ordinance was uh, used to uh, allow for, for example, the lifestyle store and, and for the parking uh, credits, that uh, those were, at that time, uh, an appropriate application of that ordinance. And, and, and my question to you has to do with today. At this point, the building has been rehabilitated, stabilized, is it not in danger of collapse, and to my mind, no longer uh, the adaptive reuse provision, no longer as it strictly states, applies to this building anymore. In other words, the question I'm asking, is it too late to apply uh, requests for non-customary permitted uses under the adaptive reuse regulation when one of the tenets of the regulation, of the ordinance, is that the building's in imminent danger of collapse or, or, or danger to the public? It's no longer that. And so how would any request made today apply under the adaptive reuse? It's no longer a building that requires adaptive reuse, I mean, uh, or remediation, I should say. Mm -hmm. That's been completed. So my, my question to you is, is this too late? And my answer would be um, the commission needs to make the findings that are listed in the ordinance in order to grant the adaptive reuse permit. There is discretion inherent within those findings, and um, there could be a reasonable difference of opinion regarding whether or not those findings can be made. But the only finding that specifically says, um, uses the, the word, fallen into such level of disrespect that economic benefits of adaptive reuse are necessary is the finding that's required only for the vacation rental use. So for other uses, I think that that terminology is not used in the ordinance. So I'm sorry if I'm not giving you um, a straightforward answer, but what I'm saying is that the commission um, has some discretion here, and those that discretion should be guided by the findings that are required, and the findings aren't necessarily as clean cut, I think, as you have described them. Okay, and that's why I'm asking these questions, because I'm trying to find out where we do have discretion and where we're running afoul of the law. My last question has to do with the lifestyle store permit. I don't know what a lifestyle store is, but let's set that aside. <laughs> there are many different lifestyles. <laughs> um, my question is, um, this use was never effected. Uh, I don't believe a business permit was ever issued for the use. In other words, no one ever applied at City Hall to create this business use. It was simply something that was allowed under the original 2018 reuse provisions. Now, is there an expiration on the uh, permitting of a use that remains unaffected for six years? Uh, yes. Um, I'm trying to find here. It's, I think it's 19.56 of the development code speaks to time limits. Um, so the applicant has two years from uh, permit approval to exercise uh, that permit. And exercise means either the permittee actually obtained a building permit and commenced construction, or has actually 
commenced the permitted use on the subject property in compliance with the conditions of approval. So in this case, my understanding is that the permit uh, was obtained. The con obviously, the construction not only commenced but concluded, and the permit was final. And so under that first prong of the time limit um, provision in 15 in 19.56040, um, the there's no it's not required that you you actually engage in the use because they satisfied the first part of that okay thank you mm -hmm. all right are there others with questions for our land use attorney mr barbos well actually i had a question for uh, christina if you would put up the findings that he that mr ruderman just mentioned in particular there seems to be a difference of the findings that are required for the vacation rental as opposed to the other adaptive reuse. So I'd like to be able to look at that. So I think we can't do that and keep Mr. Ruderman on the phone. Okay. Um, but I can't, so not the... Uh, you, you don't need to see me for this. I think you okay. can. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't think we'll be able to hear you. Okay, well, we can get him back. <laughs> But you have a nice yeah, and I do have a, a little bit of clarifying information. Uh, there was a question in 2018 what the historic report said. So in 2018, it was not listed federally or state. It was of local importance, but also a vacation rental wasn't requested, so that sixth finding didn't need to be met for the project. Oh, okay. So the finding, so we have the normal use <clears throat> permit findings of approval. And I'm assuming we're talking about the adaptive reuse. This is not the findings. This is your recommendation. Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't know that we had done that yet. Uh, it's 19.42.030. Yeah, no, I got it. I, we're just having here, there. There we go. <laughs> So the, the, the beginning of the finding is important too. The Planning Commission shall approve, with or without conditions, the adaptive reuse of a historic structure only if all of the following findings can be made. The alteration or adaptive reuse would, the first is enhance, perpetuate, preserve, protect, and restore those historic districts, neighborhoods, sites, structures, and zoning districts which contribute to the aesthetic and cultural benefit of the city. Christina, is yeah. this for the vacation rental or the wine tasting? This is all of them. So I, I think it was around specifically the language around well, like, that's the vacation number six. rental. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you wanted to go through all of them. I wanted to go or... through. Well, this is very helpful. I mean, I maybe it was in my packet. I hadn't. It's in the resolution. Yeah. All right. I'll get it in the online. Let's leave it up, though, if we could. Yeah, because this is really going to, um, it should be guiding our discussion mm -hmm. about what we're thinking about this. Um, yeah, number two, stabilize and improve the economic value of historic districts, neighborhoods, sites, structures, and zoning districts. Two, preserve diverse architectural design reflecting phases of the city's history and encourage design styles and construction methods and materials that are compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods. Four, promote and encourage continued private ownership and utilization of structures now so owned and used. Five, substantially comply with the applicable Secretary of the Interior standards and guidelines for the treatment of historic properties, as well as the applicable requirements and guidelines of this chapter. So all five of those were made for the previous project, and the Commission made those five findings for the adaptive reuse permit in 2018. What was not addressed in 2018, because a vacation rental was not proposed, the additional, the following additional finding is required for applications for adaptive reuse as a vacation rental. Six states, restore and rehabilitate a historic structure and or property, excluding second units, which is listed or eligible for listing on the state register of historic places that has fallen into such a level of disrepair that the economic benefits of adaptive reuse are necessary to stem further deterioration, correct efficient conditions, or avoid demolition as implemented in the conditions of project approval. Okay, thank you. And the, this is in our resolution? Yes. Okay, Okay. other comments? Mr. Weirich? 
I've got a lot of comments and a lot of thoughts and a lot of notes. <laughs> Are we ready to dive into this conversation? That's what we're here for. All right. Um, the Cooperage building is awesome. It's fantastic. Your mind. Cooperage building is awesome and fantastic and all those great things. I don't. I haven't heard one person say anything negative tonight about how that building has turned out, and I think that's a, uh, a testament to the professionals involved and to the uh, to the applicant. Um, it contributes significantly to the historic fabric of our town and, and our, our rich architectural history. Uh, I, I hear that congratulations are in order too for a, a Sonoma League for Historic Preservation Award from last year, which is great. Kudos to all those involved for that. Um, it's you know it's clear to me that uh, the applicant pulled all the stops uh, and the cost was really no object for this project and how great for the building. Um, while I appreciate the significant efforts toward the historic preservation, um, some of the uses requested are a little troubling to me. Aside from the implications around neighborhood compatibility that we've heard tonight from, from uh, neighbors, the sticking point for me in this whole thing is the ability of, of this body to make the findings necessary to support uh, approving the use as a vacation rental specifically. In my reading of 19.42.030, which is the, uh, Christina, if you could throw that back up on the screen, which, uh, which outlines our, our, the findings that we must make. It's six conditions here that we have to meet or that we have to uh, observe in order to uh, approve its use as a vacation rental, including the special finding in uh, in number six. The essence of number six in my reading is, but for the approval of this as a vacation rental, as a means of infusing economic feasibility, that the historic structure would fall into such a state of disrepair that uh, it would crumble and need to be demolished. I, in fact, the actual language is the economic benefits of adaptive reuse are necessary to stem further deterioration. The, the prima facie rationale reflected in the project's narrative uh, provided by the applicant says that the uses are being requested to one, add property value for resale, and two, to partially offset the cost high cost of construction which while true and uh, transparent are not supported by the development code as findings of approval um, the, the facts that are around this uh, around this project as a whole I don't think lends itself well to making a finding of economic shortcoming or or um, necessity as the code uh, says um, and it's tantamount to an ex post facto uh, approval. I mean, it's kind of outside the normal SOP around how these things are granted. I mean, between September 2015 and August of 2022, there were no less than 12 building permits issued for this location with the last permit final in November of 2024. Um, in addition to that, the use permit that was granted in May of 2018 did not, as we've discussed, did not seek vacation rental. Um, and that coupled with the scale of the project, it's subsequently added features, it's amenities, it's appointments and finishes, all nice. Um, I'm just challenged in finding that the use as a vacation rental is the only thing standing between <laughs> viability and an insolvency and um, I'm challenged too by the retroactive application of the adaptive reuse provision um, and this is all notwithstanding the fact that the May 2018 use permit expressly disallowed the use of the site as a vacation rental and while you know we don't know the specific rationale uh, behind the Planning Commission at the time expressly uh, and maybe preemptively stating that, that that would be a disallowed use, I can conclude that 
the planning commission saw fit to enshrine in those conditions that uh, there's a there's a, a belief in the community that uh, more vacation rentals above that which were already grandfathered in have a detrimental effect to neighborhoods. Uh, we've heard neighborhood concerns around the application, um, compatibility, noise, uh, parking availability, traffic congestion. There's definitely consensus in the neighborhood that, that there's some things here of concern. And um, that taken in concert with other factors, I think, have, have the effect of casting doubt as to, as to general plan consistency too, which calls for compatibility with neighborhood context. Um, I, I, I think for those reasons, I, I would have a hard time um, supporting an amendment to allow, to allow the use as a vacation rental. I might be open to discussing the merits of a wine tasting use permit in this case. Uh, I'd like to hear what other commissioners have to say. Um, you know, in my opinion, that doesn't diverge wholly from the impacts of the existing uh, approved use in that all activities occur indoors and are governed by a, you know, a, a revocable permit uh, that addresses nuisance issues. Um, you know, whether people are trying on caps or, or sipping wine, I don't think that's, uh, I think that's of limited consequence as it relates to neighborhood impact. Um, you know, as it stands now, there's no head count or capacity limits imposed by anything other than the fire code. Um, so I, I, I don't... I don't think that the grant of a, of a WTP is outside the realm, but would like to hear um, input from the rest of the commission on this topic. Thank you, Commissioner. Good luck, Mr. Willers. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Wyrick. I think you hit all of the substantial points in this and um, very thoroughly. And I want to stop, start with the first paragraph of section 1942030 which says the adaptive reuse of historic structures within the historic overlay district involving uses not otherwise allowed through the base zone may be allowed subject to the approval and conditional use in compliance with the following ordinances in other words while the while the finding says the planning commission shall approve first we have to find the threshold of whether or not this is an adaptive reuse the way i look at this permit is that it is a wholly separate use permit it is not an amendment to an original use permit the original use permit has been effectuated the building is built the permit is finalized and it is a building it is now a use permit asking for um, an intensification of use of a of an existing structure and an existing use and it is no longer an adaptive reuse under the adaptive reuse ordinance i will not be able to make the finding number six to allow for a vacation rental um, given that context and i think that the wine tasting use permit is actually an encroachment into a residential district that for the most part our general plan does not um, support so those are my comments Thank you, Mr. Willers. Who would like to go next? Matt, did you turn off your mic? Are you kicking me off? Mr. Barbos? Um, I would agree with both of uh, uh, the opinions expressed by uh, Mr. Weirich and Mr. Willers. I, I don't think that this, uh, using the adaptive reuse is appropriate here for the reasons Mr. Willers just mentioned. This is really an application for a separate use permit to allow things that weren't allowed before. And it can't be justified because of the adaptive reuse because the work has already been done. It, the project is complete. It's beautiful. We all say that. It's gorgeous. But it's not an adaptive reuse anymore. You've already done that. We're, we're done with adaptive reuse. That ship has sailed. So I am not going to vote in favor of either the vacation rental or the wine tasting. There is no way a wine tasting is going to right the economic ship that is apparently necessary even if we were even talking adaptive reuse. But given that it's a, it's a, a residential neighborhood, uh, I just, I'm not going to approve a, a wine tasting in it. 
and I'm definitely not approving a vacation rental. Okay. Ms. O'Neill. First of all, thank you to the professionals and to the McCallans for the incredible job done on this property. It's it's truly beautiful, and I think the saving of the well was really a great decision, and I do want more of the public to have access to this and be able to see this. I think it's a very special pro property, and I would like to see more of the public be able to get in there and see it. Um, cost isn't our issue. <laughs> We're the Planning Commission. We have nothing to do with the economic uh, um, ability of any applicant. And also, because we know the applicants can sell the property, and we know in particular in this one they are selling it, so none of that is, a, is an issue for us. So I want to just put all that aside and say I feel for them, but it's just not our issue. Um, I liked that historic uh, photo that uh, Michael Ross showed with the live above, work below. That was so cool. And I'd like to see it continue, live yeah. above, work below. Not vacation rental above, but live above, work below. I would like to see that. Um, I live next to a vacation rental, and I know exactly how vacation rentals work and how noisy they can be, and especially with a pool. Um, and we're not looking for more vacation rentals in the city of Sonoma. We are looking for more housing. Um, there's still the ability with this property, even with the current permit, to do a 31-day-plus rental, and that option still exists. There's the ADU there, and uh, if the ADU is going to be rented by somebody, they really don't want to be with a vacation rental as well. So um, I think that that's just a non-issue. I think that the item six is the is the clincher. It's you know we just we can't make those findings. Number six, both in the vacation rental and in the wine tasting use permit, and the wine tasting use permit it says the property use will not adversely affect the welfare of the area residents. These residents um, pr supported you in 2018. And there, the work was done, and this work was completed in a fabulous way, but that was because you had the neighborhood support. Neighborhood support is so critical, and you definitely do not have neighborhood support here and now. Um, so I think that you really just have to recognize that the neighbors did get you to this point. Um, if too much money was spent and they went f too far down the rabbit hole or, or the uh, artesian well hole, that's... Um, that's really great. You guys did a wonderful project and it will outlast all of you, but it's not our, our place to save uh, save you economically. Um, caution to the neighbors. The property's empty now. Somebody's going to move in there. You might have the noisiest neighbors with a pool party every single day of the year. You're not going to have any control over that. So um, just keep in mind that, you know, with a vacation rental, at least you do have the ability to have some regulations there. With ownership, you're not going to have any of those regulations. So caution. Um, vacation rental, if this had come forward and it was a dilapidated building and we could have looked at it, that would be something I think we would really have looked at. But what we've seen, even like with the Masonave Cottage, People have come together with proposals to put together the Masonave Cottage and make it a short-term rental. It was the original vacation rental in the city of Sonoma, but nobody has been able to find a way to develop it in such a way that it was economically feasible. If somebody then does the work and it's not economically feasible and they come to us for help, sorry, we're not here to help you economically. We are just here to look at uh, planning and and. Uh, building and, and use permits, so that's not our position to help. I do think that this property contributes massively to the historic train dist district, and I'm so glad it was sold. It was uh, sold to the McCowans and that they did all this work. I really appreciate that, um, but we just can't make the findings for either a vacation rental or a wine tasting use permit. Thank you. That's. Uh, I'll try to be succinct because I pretty much agree with everything that's been said and uh, I, I do want to reiterate the incredible um, craftsmanship and the dedication of the owners to reestablishing re this property and also to Christina for the extensive work you did and the you know the options that you gave us to consider so I really appreciate that um, but I would agree I mean um, 
while I sympathize with the owners, I mean, I've owned an old house and discovered crazy things that I had to deal with. It, it really can't be part of our decision, um, especially when we heard in some of the narrative that the, the building was yellow tagged when it started. So, um, so there was an expectation that there would be a lot of work that would need to be done. Uh, I think the bottom line for me, and this was a series of conflict for me to try to resolve, was that, um, you know, the original building was residential on top and commercial on the bottom, and the original permit asked for the same. Uh, and, and in all honesty, those are revenue streams. So, and what I heard tonight was the wine taste, I'm paraphrasing, but the wine tasting room was more of a branding. It wasn't necessarily going to bring a lot of revenue. Um, and so really based on those things and based on the fact that, that we have met the five um, aspects of, of approval, I, I too am not inclined to support this uh, amendment and really am uh, more supportive of the original um, permit from 2018. Thank you. Well, I don't know how much more I can add to the, the eloquent comments from my colleagues, but I, I have to say I, I concur with all of them. Um, it, I did a lot of, I spent a lot of time deliberating this, and I, I, think, I think Matt put it together quite well. Um, what I was really focused on going into this um, was, was community. Um, neighborhood compatibility. I, I don't think that criteria has been sufficiently met with with um, this request. And um, like my colleagues, I'm just simply not prepared to to approve it tonight. So thank you, and thanks to the work of my colleagues. And and I do too want to acknowledge the the spectacular work. This is truly a beautiful project, a, a true community benefit. And I do hope the public has the opportunity to see it. And thank you for that. Thank you all. I'll, I'll wrap up. I'm not going to really add much more to what's already been said. I concur with uh, all of it. Um, when I proposed the vacation rental ordinance in 1999, it was because I could see that there was a risk of Sonoma evolving into neighborhoods without neighbors. And I didn't want to see that happen. And I still don't want to see it happen. When I see what's happened in the county and the complaints and things that people in the county have had to put up with as the proliferation of vacation rentals has proceeded there, then I'm ever more convinced that we dodged a real bullet here in the town. And I'm appreciative that I had the support of my fellow council members in 1999 to prevent it from happening. Um, this is a, an odd situation. This is a project that, uh, for me, falls in the category of having started as a vanity project. It was going to be a special project that, uh, frankly, some very wealthy people wanted to do because it was going to be fun and interesting and exciting and, and be a place to live in town. And uh, it was not presented at the time to be um, an investment uh, with a projected return. It was about something else. And what we see as the result, and I concur with everybody else, uh, when I walk to the farmer's market, I cut through Casa Grande parking lot, and I take a look to the west, and I see the building, and it presents the profile that it always has. I feel, I feel pleased and proud of the effort that was done to keep the integrity of that building on the street and uh, and with the others. I agree, it, it, it's lovely. Now, um, the the issue now is that since the it, it plan is no longer for it to be a residence for the owner, and I want to say there's a line in the findings that talk about encouraging private ownership. I'm trying to find out what the alternative to private ownership is. I mean, a corporation can own a piece of property, and and so there's some wording there that we need to look at. Uh, private ownership is a term without reference. Um, uh, you know, what's happened now is that basically this is an investment property. And unfortunately, given the unintended expense and cost, 
the owner will never rescue or get a return on the investment. Uh, what I know of, of the owners of the building is that this will not impact you know, what they have for breakfast tomorrow morning. Um, they own Stone Edge Farm, which is a remarkable project of its own in terms of energy and hydrogen uh, generation and battery technologies and as a microgrid. I've had a tour of that property. It's an amazing place. And these are really quite remarkable people who I think for very good reasons decided to get involved with this project and then for whatever probably very good reasons as well changed their mind about what they wanted to do. So where are we today? Now we have a project for sale and and someone's going to buy it either to live there or as an investment property. Now, if it becomes a bed and breakfast and a wine tasting room and that goes with the land, then it truly becomes an investment property. Because is it, if it's a, a vacation rental, given the nature of the space, the beauty of the work that was put into it, this is not going to be a $199 a night vacation rental. This is going to be a ten thousand dollar a weekend vacation rental, so it's going to if if it becomes an investment property, it changes everything, and um, and I certainly think that the implication of private ownership is not that a property becomes an investment property. I don't know what to make of that term, private ownership, but it, it implies to me owner occupied. It you know at at. In, it, in its best manifestation. Um, so, uh, with the rest of the Commission at this point, I, I cannot support the uh, uh, requested uses, and um, I'd like some guidance from City staff as to what kind of motion we now bring to the floor to resolve the issue for tonight. So I believe, um, based on what has been discussed tonight, that the motion um, will probably be a recommendation that staff bring forward um, the resolution for denial um, with the findings in regards to um, what I've written down is specific to compatibility on the conditional use permit, the wine tasting use permit, and then also on finding number six under the adaptive reuse. Um, that those would be the findings for uh, the specific to denial, and I'll look closer. But those are the ones I just quickly noted um, during the discussion. And then the recommendation with that would be that you would continue to a date certain, being May 16th, that we would bring forward that item again. Thank you. Would someone like to incorporate uh, the recommendations of our development director into a motion? I don't think you have to repeat it verbatim since we have all this on the record. Who would like to make the motion? Okay, Mr. Chair. I will make a motion to provide direction to staff to return with a resolution denying the amendment to the use permit. Uh, and the wine tasting permit, uh, incorporating the uh, what Director Gates has enumerated in her earlier soliloquy. Is there a second? I second that. Thank you. We have a motion. Roll call, please, Ned. Sorry, just wanted to make sure that we are continuing to a date certain on May 16th. I would like to amend my motion to continue to a date certain on May. 16th. Is that acceptable to the second? Yes, that's acceptable. Thank All you. right, now we're ready for the roll call vote. Commissioner Barbos? Yes. Commissioner O'Gorman Jenkins? Aye. Commissioner O'Neill? Yes. Commissioner Willers? Yes. Commissioner Wyrick? Yes. Vice Chair Dombach? Yes. Chair Burnett? Aye. The motion passes. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. We'll take another five minute break. <laughs> this is going to... You know what? That's it's a true vanity.
Where we will come back into session. Um, I'm going to ask the indulgence of the commission to switch around a few things on the agenda to give those who remain in the audience the opportunity to get out of here a little earlier. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to close the public hearing portion um, and then reopen it after we have received the presentation of the general plan housing element and the request for the interpretation of SMC section 1954080 items 5, 1, and 5, 2. And we're actually going to put off the work program discussion till our subsequent meeting. So unless there's an objection to that. Uh, you lost me. Are you referring to 4.3? 4.3 4. we are going to come back to after we do the items for discussion. Okay. okay, so we're just switching things around a little bit. All right, so I'm going to close the public hearing portion of the meeting and move to item 5.1, which is the receipt of the presentation of the City of Sonoma General Plan and Housing Element 2023 Annual Progress Report. Right. Thank you all so much. The uh, annual progress report is an annual report that the City of Sonoma is required to prepare. It needs to be submitted by April 1st every year. It looks at a calendar year, so it's January 1st of 2023 until December 31st. It informs OPR of all of our local planning activities, and it's also just kind of fun to look back and see everything that we've accomplished over the year. The general plan APR, so we have the housing element and then the general plan APR. Obviously, the housing element is part of the general plan. And um, sorry, I'm getting confused about what's on here. I think this is so. This is what we did yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. the The biggest accomplishment under the general plan APR is the the kickoff of our general plan. We did the RFP process, selected De Novo Planning Group, had a joint kickoff meeting in October, established our general plan task force, and our uh, work worked heavily on our existing conditions report and did a lot of community outreach. We had multiple visioning workshops, community group meetings. Jennifer was out at the farmer's market uh, tabling and trying to get the word out. Uh, as we also closed out our fifth cycle housing element and overall the city over, uh, I don't know if overproduced is the, the right word, but we exceeded our allocation. What is required is required under our arena numbers was 137 total units, 24 being very low, 23 low, 27 moderate and 63 above moderate units. We produced 193 and exceeded in all of the categories. We also kicked off our six cycle housing element. Our new number is 311. And uh, unfortunately, our production in 2023 was pretty low. We only had one low unit, five moderate, five above moderate. This is pretty typical for, for the city. Since I've been working on the reports, it's very cyclical. We're so small that we typically have small year, small year, and then big years, and then it'll be uh, kind of repeat that cycle. So it's not surprising and is demonstrated by the number of housing applications that we have in process. And so this is really kind of the exciting news looking forward. These are all housing units that we have in progress right now. So there's a total of 120 units, including 22 affordable units. And so all of these, these projects, um, the top three are actively in process and will be coming before the Planning Commission. Hummingbird Cottages, just got their final map at City Council, so those will be under construction shortly. It's the, a lot of the rough grading has taken place. 1211 Broadway is actively under construction, and uh, I'm not sure what the timeline is on that. And then for, with the Sonoma Hotel, there were eight units approved there. We also have a number of zoning code amendments that went through. We did the residential component, ADU ordinance, updated our parking code, objective standards for driveways and fire apparatus, as well as a design review streamlining. And we also adopted our housing in Luffy. It was recommended in 2018 and finally put into, into place in, um, 
is it June? October? I forget. <laughs> we accomplished a number of goals under our homeless services. And really our, our primary year was reorganizing our department. We got brought Jennifer on, created a new community de development department. I've been working hard on our online tracking system, adopted the downtown parking management plan, started and almost completed the Chase Street Bridge project. So there's a lot of really good work um, that went on last year. Moving forward, our, our big task is really going to be uh, getting that general plan underway. The existing conditions report is just about finished, and we'll be having a, a public meeting with the Joint Planning Commission City Council in the coming months, and then we start working on the land use map. We did complete our uh, stakeholder interviews already. We have one more to go, and continuing to have our joint uh, tree committee meetings climate action policies and keeping those projects uh, moving through the pipeline. So overall, a lot of really good work has been done and um, really happy to have Jennifer on and keep moving that department in the right direction. Thank you, Christina. Are there any uh, questions for staff? Donna? I have one question for clarification. So um, I think there were of the back a few slides, there were pending projects, 120 units. Mm -hmm but only 22 affordable. So, the, I mean, the estimate would be 25%, right? 30. So uh, we do have provisions in our code to, uh, in the inclusionary housing ordinance for units that are smaller than 850 square feet. Mm -hmm. So the it's actually a really interesting two of the projects, so 254 First Street East, the majority of them are small units, and so the inclusionary only applies to those over 850, and same with the uh, Sonoma Highway project. They're all less than um, 850 square feet. The one that's affordable is an ADU. So a follow-up question for those that are 850. Um, I'm guessing those are affordable by design. That's the goal. But um, so what, doesn't that fall into a category? Does it fall? Does it fall into a category of moderate affordable? We could so in we could claim it as not deed restricted. Potentially, we would have to look at um, how we want to do that when the building permits come in. So there is an option to do deed restriction or not? Deed no, so they're not deed restricted. Mm -hmm. And when we do our annual progress report, there are different categories and a house can be affordable, deed restricted, or not deed restricted. So we kind of do the affordability level. So for, for an ADU, for example, is not a deed restricted affordable housing unit, but it, we typically count it as a moderate income unit. Okay, any other questions? No, if not, I will open it up to the public. I think there are a couple of you who are, who are here to make comments. I don't know why that my items always are last on these every meeting I go to, but uh, somehow it always seems to work out that way. Um, I had a couple questions, uh, <clears throat> probably for staff. With the uh, arena allocation, I think with the uh, with the 311, you have have like 40 extremely low, f more or less 40 very low and 40 low, and I think that if you if you go four years and you don't meet half of your arena allocation, then then the city's subject to SB 35 streamlining. Is that true? Right. There's that was for the last housing element. I believe right now I don't believe there's anything on the books as far as what happens if we don't meet our our number partway. Okay, but that's possible that it could still. Yes, that's correct. So if that's the case, then I think that if, if by four years, if there weren't 20, if half would be 20 extremely low, 20 very low, and 20 low by four years, then the city might possibly be subject to SB 35 streamlining if that's that law is still on the books. And I also wanted to just kind of question the, uh, the First Street East uh, 850 square foot units as affordable by design. Because I recall that that during the SB9 process, that in the Planning Commission, it was said that 700 square foot units were not w would go market rate that they couldn't be affordable by design. So it seems to me that this project is kind of doing an end run around the city's inclusionary ordinance, 
and that uh, that that might be what you'd call materially uh, against affirmatively furthering fair housing law by by not including the 25 percent inclusion so that's something that I know that the city has been working on code to and this is a year where housing is a priority for the city council that that it seems to me that that rule the exception that the city count or the planning commission and the city made in that regard should maybe be looked at as materially uh impeding affirmatively furthering fair housing because you're only going to at the end of that project you're only going to end up with one or two low income units on the whole east side and so that just doesn't seem right from an affirmatively furthering fair housing standpoint so that was something that that i i hadn't you know, I looked at the property with Kelso, and and I just started looking at it, and it kind of putting two to and two together, and uh, so that's what occurred to me that um, and studied my affirmatively furthering fair housing. So um, that was basically my couple of comments, and um, thank you for not doing the three minutes. I appreciate that. All right, and uh, anyone else? Caitlin? Good evening, Caitlin Cornwall, Sonoma Valley Collaborative. Um, um, I wasn't actually going to say anything, but it, it, Fred did remind me. It is something that um, our members talk about, uh, just whether they're, like, what does it take to produce something that is affordable by design in the city of Sonoma? Um, and probably the answer changes a little bit every year, because um, that's how prices go. but. Um, it would be a bad thing if the city was calling something affordable by design when it's not. And uh, I'm not really sure what the solution is, um, but um, it is something, you know, let's not delude ourselves. We have a crisis. Let's like build what we have to build um, or permit what we need to permit. Thank you. That's all I had. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else on this matter? Okay. Seeing none, we'll bring it back for any comments or questions so i just want to caution just no comments specific to any projects that have not been heard by you or have been agendized so we need just caution thank you um, I would like to follow up on that question about um, affordable by design and market rate and i would just like to point out that those are not in violation of each other. Something can be affordable by design and be sold at market rate. So I think that we do need to get a little more clarity on what we define as uh, affordable by design, but um, I do believe in having affordable by design and market rate in the same property. Okay, any other comments? If not, we will thank you for your comments and we'll move on to the uh, Next item, which is 5.2, a request for interpretation of SMC section 1954.080 design review. And we'll get the staff report. Sorry, I was used to sitting back here. Um, so Jennifer Gates, uh, Community Development Director, before you tonight is a request for an, an interpretation. Um, there are a couple of sections in the uh, design review code table um, that um, in our minds conflict. And so when looking at it, this is the main sections. So we recently have had some requests um, for modifications to the rear of structures that fall within the constructed over 45 years. Haven't determined whether they're historic or not. Um, it's just a general application at this point um, for a building permit for mostly window modifications. And sometimes they're a replacement or it could be a, a configuration such as a, a window size changing or a window conversion to like a patio door. Um, so as noted in here, we have a design review exemption for all existing residential development that says building and site maintenance, repainting, and in-kind replacement of exterior materials. It does not require design review. 
but we do have, if you go to the very bottom, repair replacement of window, siding, roofs, or other building materials in kind for those constructed over 45 years are major. And then under three, the alterations to the rear of existing structures that's not visible from the public right of way that increases the floor area by less than 10% or 200 square feet, um, whichever is less, also does not require design review. However, a window modification, including the change of window material configuration or opening size or location, does require design review and is considered major. Um, the window modification doesn't actually clarify where it is located um, versus the alterations to the rear of the existing structure. You go to the next slide. Um, so staff um, has the ability, or community development director does have the ability to make an interpretation. This is one of those interpretations though that I did want to bring to planning commission's attention because in strict application, the most restrictive does apply. Most restrictive in this case would be a window replacement would require design review, even if it's not visible from the public, but I can add 200 square feet to the back without, as long as it's not visible. And so this is where just wanted further clarification uh, from the Planning Commission to provide an interpretation as to that application. Staff's recommendation is that for windows or exterior material alterations not visible from the public right of way, be exempt from design review consistent with the um, basically the application of the first um, uh, de for sorry for construction um, of residential structures over 45 years old. So with that, if you could provide an interpretation as you see it, staff would appreciate it. Okay, any questions why, before we why 45 years? So for historic resources, we look at, <laughs> Bill experienced this recently, um, for construction over um, 45 years is what we look like, we would look at for historic resources because 50 years, an arbitrary number that was created a long time ago and um, identified a 50 year mark as being what's historic. And so when we look at 45, we're preemptively looking at something that potentially would be historic or could be historic today but maybe not be 50 years old yet. Any other questions before we get into a discussion? Let me see if there's anyone in the public who has a comment on this. So this, excuse me, uh, this came up with one of my clients and uh, it's, you know, I sit on a, Ron Wellander put a committee together, you may know about it, a roundtable committee, and our mission statement is to expedite the building plan review process. We're making great strides there. And to expedite the approval process, the entitlement process. Something like windows, I'm a fenestration fanatic. I've, I've won 30 awards for historic preservation. And the last thing I'd want to see is an inappropriate window on a historic building. But to me, this is a staff issue. I sat in a meeting with Jennifer and Ned Forrest the other day discussing a couple projects. And I think Ned made the comment that I could determine in two minutes if a window is appropriate or not on a historic building. I think this is something Matt could be trained to establish but you know for this to for a window replacement to trigger major design review it's contrary to expediting the entitlement process and it's I think it's just overkill and then one other sort of side comment I've chaired a design review commission before in Napa and and I've been on a design review commission in Hawaii and one of the sort of basic principles of design review, in my experience, is stay out of people's backyards. So if somebody is now putting a window in their backyard and it's triggering major design review, I think we've got a problem. So I'd like you to really see if you could clean this ordinance up and, and uh, clarify it and simplify it. Okay, thank you, Tom. Let's bring it back to the Commission. We've got a request 
to modify uh, our category of window repair or replacement. Um, Mr. Willers, you're an architect. What's your what's your view? I have a question, actually. Um, so a building's 45 years old, 46 years old. We'll make it easy. Um, Where, when is the HRE triggered? According to the code, the historic resource evaluation is required for a design review for buildings constructed over 45 years. Anywhere? Mm -hmm. Okay. But th th that's where I wanted to start. So we have the potential, so any building in the city of Sonoma over 45 years old, whether it's on 2nd Street East, or Joaquin gets triggered. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way <laughs> at all. I'm just bringing it back into the context. Triggers an HRE, a historic resource evaluation. That historic resource evaluation, I, as I understand it, is going to determine whether or not it's a historic resource and then the windows by default will have to be either subject to that HRE or not. But the HRE is the original, dot, you know, it's not Matt. You know, Matt's not a hired consultant to do HREs. And so I understand, I understand clearly the frustration with this issue, having just gone through it on a building that probably shouldn't have had to go through it, but it did. And, and everyone was satisfied. Um, but but we do live in a community that is made up of buildings that are potentially, have potential historic value that some of us may not see as historic buildings. And that's where the HRE comes into play and that's where the administrative or the over review in some cases, if you wanna call it that, comes into play is to protect those things that may be overlooked because someone of and, and again, it's not a disparaging, but someone without the expertise evaluates it to be all, oh, you know, it's a track house. It was built in 1950, looks like every other house on the block. Let's go, you know? What does it make any difference to replace the windows? Where the windows in the back may be important is the windows in the front. But, you know, otherwise we're gonna end up with facades of historic buildings. The front of the building will be the historic fabric of our town and behind it, like a storefront, is a little box that's been remodeled. And so, you know, so for me, I think the quality of a historic structure is important and, and it's not just the front of the building. Um, you know, the, the Secretary of the Interior Standards considers it the entire structure, not necessarily the interior, unless the interior is a, an important historic feature. And so, you know, I'm caught in this dilemma where I want to make it quick for my clients, but I also am sitting here and wanting to make sure that we fulfill what the basic intent of CEQA was, and that is to protect buildings from being torn down that may have some other historic importance other than how they look, right? And that's the only way you can capture that is through that evaluation. And so if we change it to no, then we have, or my, is no, so that's why I'm asking. So if we change that rule, how does it, how does that HRE get triggered? So for clarification, this would not actually change the code. It's going to provide guidance <laughs> on how we move forward with changes to this section the of the code. Yeah, right. Um, right now, the question is, you know, really about this conflict. If I can do something to the rear of my structure right now, but I can't change the window in the rear, there's for us a conflict, right? So that's really what I'm focused on. The HRE, you're right. So HRE is triggered by the discretionary action. So that's why we're pulling the HRE, we're complying with CEQA, um, because we have a discretionary, something discretionary occurring. Um, 
you know, it, one of the things that we're talking about with the streamlining team um, is creating more of an administrative process around this in the future um, and being more of like, is it historic or not? Let's get the HRE. And if it's not, let's move forward. If it is, let's talk about it. So that's where those historic resource evaluations come in and they make that determination. So that's where so the that's conversation the to level, come. That's the first level on the flow chart. If it's 45 years or older, HRE. Uh, 45 years or older, HRE. Yes, no. No, you're off to, to building permit. Yes, you're subject to the all of these things. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's the intent and that may of what be, we did. And that may be the intent. Right now, though, it's, it's a little it's a little convoluted. And so that's where, for this instance, we have, I think, three or four applications that have windows that are not visible um, from the public right-of-way that are active building permits that were in this weird place. Um, and so that's what I'm asking for today is really about how do we want to interpret this section was the window modification because I we weren't here and we, we were talked about it too but the window modification was the intent previously before I think it was about whether what was alterations in the public view and then it was modified and so this is where did we intend um, or in for that window modification to act to be about the public view um, or what's in the public right-of-way view or not and that's where we're asking for your interpretation of what that is and then also the repair or replacement um, of in kind when we said in kind was okay but maybe it's not okay for 45 so I just want to be very clear when we are inter interpreting the code so again, I'm going to go back so that I'm going to go back to kind of through the process because that's mm -hmm. the way I understand it. So I've got a project 45 years or older. My first step is an HRE if I'm asking for a discretionary review, mm -hmm. even if I'm trying to replace or add on in the back of the building. If as long as it triggers a discretionary review, otherwise you're going straight to a building permit. Right. So. Um, but doesn't that 45 year threshold trigger that? With a discretionary, with a discretionary with some review. form, yeah, with some. Mm -hmm. So I, so for the alterations to the rear of the existing structures that's not visible, no HRE would be required. That's where the, that's where the problem is, I think, honestly, because that's not, that is potentially not capturing um, projects that may you know, I'm on both sides of the fence of this, completely on both sides of the fence. But it, but it's also an issue that may be not capturing buildings that are that have some value historically, and and the windows may be important to that structure as a element. It's the it's the tough part. I right. Um, so when we talk about this in the future, we'll talk about historic preservation to um, I can talk about it now if you want to get into a little bit more about it. Um, if you have questions around historic preservation and the why the public, uh, visible from the public right of way you see in ordinances, we can talk about that if that's something that you want to talk about. I, I'd like to follow up on Commissioner Willer's comment because either we deem a property 45 years and older to warrant an HRE or we don't and if we're going to say that they're adding 200 square feet in the back and it's not visible so they don't need an HRE I think we are missing the whole point of <coughs> the historic preservation um, so that's I, I would agree with him that's the question is whether or not any property that's going to have the 200 square feet added hidden should be required to have an HRE so again, that, that's a, that will be when we move forward with the changes, that'll be a policy decision that you all will make at that time. 
typically um, the ordinances that I've worked on in the past, it's been about the public, what's, what's visible from the public, because historic preservation is a public benefit. That is the reason why we can regulate it in our zoning code. Um, and, uh, and that's the main impetus for it. Doesn't mean we can't have design review about things um, or historic preservation review is really what it is um, about additions or alterations to structures. It's what level of detail do you um, want to review or create policy around moving forward in the future. Um, I didn't mean to open up this whole thing. Um, it's just we had... You can blame it on me. No, you're fine. Um, do you want to join the other ad hoc? <laughs> Um, we'll talk about that next month. Um, <laughs> or you can say you want to in the comments. Um, I didn't mean to open this uh, hornet's nest, but I do want to be able to give these building permit uh, applications right now that no, yes, you we are going to do an HRE and take you to design review for modifications that aren't visible. So that's what I'm asking for if that's the direction or not. To make a comment, I mean, I, I'm actually am supportive of your recommendation. Um, and part of that is because um, I, when I think about a structure, I think about it holistically. And um, we do change the insides of most of these structures. So you really don't know what you're getting um, unless um, in, often in these historical situations. And I feel that th three sides are already um, maintained, and it's a two-way door decision. Even if you change the back, you know what the original structure is. So I guess I'd really wonder, um, you could con conceivably revert it back if you, if you were so wanted to, and um, I'm just wondering if there really would be a loss that wasn't retrievable um, if we allowed uh, more modifications on the back, but still maintain three quarters of the integrity of this the structure. So I'm, that's my point of view. I'm supportive of the recommendation. You can take away it. I I would I'm okay with additional square footage because again these things are two word, two way decisions. You can bring you can take it away and bring it back. Um, reconstruct it. So I think that they're malleable and they can be undone and redone. So I I personally don't have, I'm trying to think of a situation where if you did that it would be so detrimental to the original integrity of the building that you couldn't reproduce that. Uh, Mr. Weirich? I would join Commissioner Dombeck and her sentiments around around this. I think that um, history is we're writing history right now I mean it's a constantly you know we talk about this 45 year rolling period I mean at, at some point that's going to affect every house in our city um, I'm not offended I mean I understand the holistic approach to keeping all four sides consistent with with the architectural era or whatever we want to term it but I'm. I, I would be more apt to adopt your uh, interpret or the interpretation that uh, Donna has suggested around uh, not triggering additional design review uh, with modifications that are not visible from the public right way. And I, I, I might even go further to say, uh, you know, when we revisit this, modifications that aren't visible from the the A side because you think about driving down Fifth Street East, you see the backs of a lot of homes mm -hmm. in Estimadera. You see the backs of, you know, that, that's visible from the public right way, even though it's the back of the house. It's something to think about when we, when we revisit this. Um, but uh, I, would, I would be supportive of, of the less restrictive um, interpretation here. Anyone else? Yeah, um, I, I agree with um, Commissioners Dombach and Weiwick, but I d definitely just feel like that inconsistency that's there is the problem. 
and which way we should go. I mean, obviously we're going to have to come back and revisit this and get this a little bit more clarity. And for somebody who's well over 45 years old, yeah, it's really weird to think of the 1980 house as being historic, but it's a moving target, right? Um, so I'd be fine with going uh, to make this more consistent for the time being, but with the goal too that we come back and revisit this as a whole and when we would like to see an HRE triggered and how much leeway we even have in that. Okay. Um, well, on this subject of the HRE, I, uh, uh, how, much, how much typically would an HRE cost? A, ch a simple project for just Windows uh, would be the lowest would be about 2800 I think the most is 8000 So this is not a minor expense. No, no. And um, I'm concerned, um, particularly as we get into categories of types of homes, that we're, we're, we're slipping into, a, I don't know if I want to use the word, bureaucratic uh, quicksand here. Um, where uh, essentially um, a perfectly ordinary remodel is is triggering an HRE on a house that's never going to be deemed historic. Now, I say that blithely. What constitutes a house that's historic? One of the criteria, I'll take the uh, Canard House on 3rd Street. <coughs> It doesn't exist anymore because it was deemed not historic. So one of the criteria for historic under the HRE is did a person of note live in that home and is that significant enough to, to call it historic? I mean, will 637 Fifth Street East one day be historic? Without a doubt. Because Larry Barnett lived there? <laughs> So, so this gets pretty murky um, and goes well beyond just the style of the house. It gets into the history of the house. And I, I don't know exactly how to resolve this murkiness because uh, if we imagine that someday, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way, the houses in the Mockingbird development are deemed historic because they've hit 45 years and anybody who wants to remodel the, one of those houses has to pay somewhere between two and eight thousand dollars to remodel the house. It'll be more by then. <laughs> and it'll be more by then. Seems to me to be pretty onerous. Uh, I, I don't know how to solve the issue. I think Jennifer's trying to uh, na navigate her way through this in a logical way, but in a way you could refer to it as cutting the baby in half. This is kind of a Solomonic uh, solution, which is if you can see it, it matters, and if you can't see it, ah, do whatever the hell you want. Um, and and I and I'm honestly torn. I mean, having <clears throat> remodeled a nineteen uh, a World War II shack moved from Mare Island after World War II to Fifth Street East and having remodeled that and people who owned it before me, the, sh the shack, had remodeled it in the 70s. I mean, what constitutes historic? I mean, the house I live in goes all the way back to 1945, really. It was moved to Sonoma in 1952 so it's 70 some odd years old. It's not a historic house, unless you want to consider my presence there. Uh, so so there's, there's something dicey about this whole thing. I don't know how to deal with it. Island. Yeah. There wasn't a, there wasn't a square two by four in the, in the shack. I can tell you that. Uh, so. But. I understand, and I, I have read some of these HREs, and I, I had great objections to the HRE that was produced on the Canard House. Um, I mean, as far as that HRE was concerned, Bob Canard never existed, 
as a person of note. Uh, it was very, I, I found it very awkward. So, uh, so the HREs are also not ob all that objective. They're clearly a subjective product, and there's no doubt that there are HRE specialists who write them slanted in one way or another to, depending upon whether the owners want to be considered historic or whether they don't. I mean, it is not a precise science. So, I, I, I'm, I'm really not certain how I feel about it. Um, the idea that um, that a window facing the greenhouse in my backyard is going to be subject to scrutiny when my house hits 45 years old doesn't make any sense to me at all. And uh, but from uh, the integrity of historic structures standpoint, speaking as a purist, it obviously should make a difference. So I'm, I'm having real trouble with this. Especially because that greenhouse brings you so much joy. Yeah. Yes, the greenhouse brings me joy. And there's only cactus. The and there's only cactus in the greenhouse. Yeah, no, there's, there's nothing else. I'm not growing anything weird other than weird cactus. So um, I don't, I don't, I don't know how easy it's going to be to give you what you want. Well, this is why I was asking you all. <laughs> um, so, like I said, there's a few applications that are in process. Strictest application for staff's interpretation of this code is that all window modifications have to go to design review. That is our strictest interpretation. That's what would apply unless planning commission <clears throat> decides otherwise. Um, my goal with our lovely team, maybe one more, um, is to bring you something within the next like three months um, and really have a <clears throat> kind of set up schedule of and maybe start the discussion um, in the sense of like more of education around historic preservation and start talking about that first um, and then go from there and, and our requirements being a certified local government and all that fun stuff that I'm starting to do with our design review uh, historic preservation commission as well um, we already started talking about this as well with them um, and just kind of the needs for some update and streamlining um, so if you want to maintain the strict interpretation that staff would apply, which is as written, um, that is fine. Or if you want to propose a different one, that is fine. This is only until such time as a code amendment code amendment happens. So we're just this is just an interim mm -hmm. approach. Yes. And, and, is, and is it? Are, are the locations of these property applications germane to this decision? I mean, you're looking to get a sense tonight because there's two applications in the pipeline. Three. Three. Four. I think there's three or four. Three or four, okay. And you'd like to provide some clarity to those applicants. Before we have Sooner them. rather than later. Yeah, I mean. The, rather than putting them off for three months. Right. In some cases, I think we have one application where it's just literally one window changing to a door. And so they would be required to do the HRE and determine if it's historic or not. Another one is multiple windows that are not visible. And, um, and, and, and so there's different and applications, And that's my right? question. I mean, yeah. typically, you know, if, if I could see what the house looked like, if I could see what what it looked like, it would be easier to make a decision, but then we're into a design review. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm trying to keep it a general <laughs> um, and try if to make equally. It too hard, people don't even get permits. They're just going right. to. Yes. You know, it's, it, yeah. I mean, seriously, if we make it such an obstacle, nobody's coming to us for permits. They're going to just do the work. Especially a backyard window yeah. that's going to come and go, and yep. nobody will be the wiser. So the whole specific window modification element of the code came about because 
there was a period of time when windows on historic structures were being changed out with vinyl windows because everyone was making their house energy efficient. And and that was clearly not an acceptable thing <laughs> in the community. And it got and it got it became an issue. And so now we have, for lack of a better way of saying, an, an overly re maybe overly restrictive code because of reaction to what happened because there wasn't care being taken in the community about that matter. And and so you can, you know, so I guess we have to determine whether or not a window in the back that's original to the building gets changed to vinyl and that's okay. So that's, you know, that's what we're coming down to. Um, At the moment we're only talking about windows. I it, it's siding it's anything not visible, but if you want to make it very specific to just the window conversation, I'm fine with that as well. Um, it's more significant and, and harder to reverse once you've done the whole wall. All right. And so the clarification on the replacement, the repair or replacement of windows, siding, roofs, or other building material, the key on that one, it says in kind. It doesn't say change. It just says in kind. What, what does that mean? That's a policy that we still need to write of what in kind means. Um, yeah, but you could you could end up with a house that's forty five in years old, where you got a window that developed dry rot, and because it's a wooden sill and a, an old sash type window, and and. And 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 it and it clearly needs to be repaired. It's 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 damaged to the building, and the dry rot's going to spread, and it it's got to be done. Um, I don't want to make it life difficult for somebody who wants to repair and replace a window. But, but that's already covered. Repair. And so. It, well, no, it, on, it, on an existing. It's conflicts. But not if you get to forty-five years. In a 45, once you get the building that's 45 years with a dry rot window, you're stuck and you got to do this, you got to jump through all these hoops. So our application of in kind would be, let's say a wood window, four over three, which is the mullion pattern, um, would be the same. It would still need to be a divided light, wood window, four over three. Um, siding, where stucco needs to stay stucco, where cedar, we're going to stay cedar. It's the modification to that. Um, the modification of the design. Of the, yeah, the, of the like, look. let's say, yeah, the look. Where, say, we wanted, we really want to be uh, board and batten. We don't want to be lap siding anymore. Well, that's a change, right? That's not in kind. But are the applications you've got all window related? Ours are all window right now. And these are the ones that you want to deal with? I do. And so my position then would be to expedite this for your department and for these applicants is to say that they don't need a design review to simply replace a window if they wanted to change a window to a door yeah they'd need to do something maybe but for just replacement of a win of a window I, I Regardless of what side it's on, or are you just talking about the back? I'm talking about the back. That's okay. that's that's what's come up. That as far as I'm, I'm willing to risk it on three app, three or four applications for windows in the back of the house. So is the back the back, or is the back not visible from the public? Way? I will say this is what I'm I'm going to say. Um, even if we got an HRE and it's determined that it's eligible, the replacement of that will meet the Secretary of Interior standards for that replacement. Because it's not visible, it's also, as Commissioner Dombach um, stated, could be put back. And that's one of the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. You can modify. Well, then let's use that. So, and, and that's that's why I was, I wasn't gonna try to go there right this second, I just, but go there? Okay. All right, so yes. <laughs> All right. Okay, so to run run through that option again. Sure. So we're going so if 
it is not visible and it is a modification and it you can put it back it will meet the secretary of interior standards and what do you so mean by put it back you mean so if somebody wanted to in the future let's say they wanted to restore the historic resource yes it could be restored i see so it wouldn't entail such a dramatic structural change that the, that the basic structure of the building right was so altered. one of the examples um that commissioner willers was talking about call lovingly facadectomies or facadomies um and facadomy yes it's really bad that we do. sounds like it's awful it's awful but it's awful what happens so i have plenty of pictures i actually had a facebook group um in which literally the only the front of the building was saved and the rest of it was gone no no and we've seen that happen here on remodels where right. the, the rule wall. was the preservation of one wall and everything else was right. different and the only thing you saved was so one wall. So that doesn't meet the Secretary of Interior standards. Right. So the in, the intent of, you know, and the hope when we move forward is talk more about, all right, what are the standards? What are, what's integrity? Um, what makes something historic? And then go into the level of detail in the sense of, okay, if, if it's not historic, maybe we have a different category that they fall. But if they're 45 years, maybe we need to determine that. Or if we have windows that are being requested to be replaced and they were replaced 20 years ago, they're not, they, there's no integrity anymore to those windows. So maybe we should just allow those to be replaced. So those are the types of things that we'll talk about when we move forward with some of these changes too. Does that help? Yes. So. Is everyone in general agreement on that, or do we need a motion? I agree. <laughs> You're confused. You don't need a motion for a direction, do you? Well, so so for one of them, I, I'm not clear on so the window going to a French door. So, so to me, that's a window modification and a change in the opening and the location. So the good? interpretation recommendation was that anything not visible from the public view would not require design review but if it if we can see it it's going to design review and it will be a discretionary action and that is a window modification including the change of window material configuration or opening size or location i can I, uh, anything that you can see if i am on if i'm on a sidewalk on the street and i can see it i can see it so we've had a couple that we we can see, and we, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and I see shrubs and fences in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I so that's part of what we need to write into it because shrubs die, and fences change, <laughs> right? Um, but buildings stay. Well, I can go along with your proposed solution <clears throat> for now. And uh, someone want to make a motion? Do we need a motion for this or not? So we're going to work on modifying language in here moving forward again, right? Because yes. we just modified this language. I know. <laughs> one of my one of my things is I I think the ten percent two hundred square feet thing is a total. It, it's totally weird. I, it's I a little arbitrary. It, I get it from trying to reduce the amount of impact on the mm -hmm. building. But if I have an 800 square foot house, why mm -hmm. should I be limited to 80 square feet when my 2,000 square foot neighbor can add 200 square feet on the house? Why isn't it just 200 square feet or less? Or just get rid of it, you know? That, that's going to be for a later date. But, Future discussion. Let's but, see if we can resolve this for tonight. Yeah. I keep asking the question, do we need a motion? I would I would request just a motion for interpretation. Okay. Would someone like to make a motion? I motion that we accept um, Director Gates' proposal that in the interim period we allow um, modifications of windows and the and areas that cannot be seen by the public until we can further revise the language uh, of the code of the review point of clarification on your motion is it just windows or are we talking about because for purposes of the Christina's question you, about I the door oh, just a point of clarification Commissioner Dombach you said windows only 
but I understood there was a door. So are we also talking about material configuration as well? I would I would say yes because that's yes. one of the uh, one of the outstanding questions. I would second that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a motion and a second, Natalie. Your job is on the floor. Commissioner Barbos. Yes. Commissioner O'Gorman Jenkins. Aye. Commissioner O'Neill. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Willers. Yes. Commissioner Wyrick. Yes. Vice Chair Domba. Yes. Chair Barnett. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, now my question is we're going to put off the work plan till the next meeting, and we have this discussion about sidewalk seating permits. Is that something that you are planning to take to the city council at their next meeting? In other words, is the action on that essential tonight? So um, my goal is to take it by May for the first reading on May 15th so that the second reading is June so that we can start enforcing it for this summer. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the goal um, for bringing let, it tonight. Let me get the tenor of the commission. It's now 20 of 10 um, and uh, this is such a voluble and expressive group. Um, would you like to take this matter up, assuming we could get it done by ten? We have to before yes. the summertime. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, mean, I, I'm I think hungry, it's. I think it's this timely. Has to be done. <laughs> Why don't you eat dinner before the meetings? I have to eat two dinners. <laughs> oh, that's right. You run twenty-six miles. I keep forgetting. Okay, we'll now take up item four point three. Thank you for sitting here Thank you. through this. <laughs> Um, uh, let's get on to 4.3, which is also a public hearing. So I'll reopen public hearings. Consideration of discussion and possible action about sidewalk seating permits. I assume we have a staff report. We do, and I'll try to be quick. Uh, to sum up, we have two sections of the code that govern outdoor dining. One is kind of generic for all outdoor dining, dining displays and sales standards as well. And then in chapter 12, we have our sidewalk seating permit. Neither of them have been updated in quite a while. This issue became more prevalent with our COVID-19 programs in Alfresco, where we basically opened the doors and let people do whatever they wanted. And there was a lot of desire expressed by the community and businesses to increase sidewalk dining and have more opportunities to in, have an engaged uh, sidewalk presence, especially on the plaza. We currently do not have a comprehensive standard for outdoor dining or seating for tasting rooms. Historically, around the plaza, there is sidewalk seating allowed through individual use permits, but there is not sort of a comprehensive approach. And they are not allowed through Chapter 1950-060 or Chapter 1206. Both of those are specific to restaurants. And so the goal is to establish a comprehensive annual permitting and monitoring process for all seats on the sidewalk and this will really help the city to ensure that there's proper insurance compatibility with the American Disabilities Act as well as ABC regulations and um, there's a, another little change just with the ordering to to make the ordinance a little bit more logical so open for questions okay is that fast enough that was good I have some questions if I understand it correctly the uh, ABC, alcohol, beverage, and whatever it is, um, requires that if alcohol is consumed on the sidewalk, at a sidewalk table, that it, that area must be clearly delineated with structural elements that cordon it off from the rest of the sidewalk. Is that correct? That is correct, and the chamber is working with all the businesses to identify one design so that we are consistent throughout the plaza. Okay, and do those do those dividers or or structures um, are they as simple as a as a standard with a rope, 
or do they have to be more substantial than that? They do not need to be more substantial. They can be um, stanchions with a rope. Okay, and obviously in order to accommodate uh, a space for a waiter or a service person or the ability to pull a chair out or for seating, that rope and stanchion distance from a table and chairs such as we're looking at on the screen here is probably going to add in the case of wine tasting three feet to the space taken up by the edge of the table. So you've got the table and chairs which it looks like in this picture are probably uh, uh, you know 20 I don't think these are 36 inches but call them 24 inches that's two feet and then you've got another three feet to the stanchions so you've already got five feet what's the width of most of our sidewalks I guess they vary depending on what side of the plaza you're on okay so one of my concerns is um, how are we going to uh, enforce and provide uh, a standard that is adhered to when you have movable furniture and movable stanchions that are taken up, put up and taken down every day. Then what do we do about circumstances where there is a garbage can on the sidewalk which is also narrowing the area of pedestrians to walk? It, is that part of the five feet of the pedestrian area or is the pedestrian area have to be completely free and clear of any obstruction? I see you're nodding your head. I which... am nodding my head. So okay. we are going to be requiring site plans as part of that seating permit and they will need to identify and we'll confirm with pictures too of what all the impediments are existing in that right of way. So they will need to show compliance with five feet. Five feet could be from the tree, could be from a light pole, it could be from the signs that we have in our right of way. And so it could be five feet this way, this way, any way from that. It'll include to make sure that's ADA compatible, it will need the minimum turnaround space yeah. for a wheelchair. The tables will need to comply as well for ADA accessibility. So there will be certain places in town that are not going to be able to have a table to meet the five feet. The well, I, th I think, for example, the tables that have been outside and around the girl in the fig and the Sonoma Hotel. Right here. Mm -hmm. No way that, that they're going to get their five feet. In my opinion, certainly not on First Street, uh, First Street West, where the sidewalks narrower. Yeah, if I, I was just going to add, so the these processes have been in place for the city for a really long time. We're not introducing anything new. It just has not been enforced since COVID. So historically, yeah. we had a sidewalk seating permit. We had applications. There was a requirement to come in. Um, so this, none of these requirements are new. Now we have our online permit tracking system. And just with, with COVID, we're trying to make sure that we're being fair with everyone and have really clear standards. Let me say that you know part of this is just my institutional memory. There's a comment in the staff report that refers to the city has long supported sidewalk dining, and and that's not true. The ordinance goes back to 93. <laughs> that may be so, but I can tell you right now that when I was on the city council, nobody was getting any sidewalk dining approved, period. There may have been an ordinance that approved it, but the Public Works Department absolutely nixed every application and every proposal we never approved one never and it was it was a complaint on the part of the restaurants and, and businesses around the plaza some of whom wanted to do outdoor display of merchandise and that's the other thing I want to talk about but it, it was considered by public safety and public works to be a danger to pedestrian traffic and we never got any of them done no matter who requested it so 
so I understand something may be, may have been on the books, but I joined the council in '94 and was there for 12 years, and it never happened in the 12 years I was there. Couldn't happen. So um, I don't think it was really until the COVID effect that that all the concerns about public safety and the thoroughfare and pedestrian issues came to the fore. And to me, that opened the door to this whole topic and changed it, and in many ways proved that it was a perfectly viable thing to do. It kind of blew all these assumptions about danger to pedestrians and people tripping on chair legs and all the other stuff that had been brought up as to be basically irrelevant, which is great, because I, I, I like the idea of sidewalk seating. Um, I'm concerned about the enforcement. I'm glad to hear you want to have design plans for everybody because this, in addition to garbage cans, there's newspaper boxes, and and um, it's it's not it's not a clear space for everybody in the same way. Um, I want to talk about the outside merchandise, the sale. It it if I were read this correctly, this is also potentially approving the sale of merchandise on the sidewalk. So that's the, the existing code section. There's no changes that are proposed to that. Small changes. Okay, but... Like very, uh, very minor. Uh, and so at present, do we allow the sale of merchandise on the sidewalk? At the present, we have a permit process for people to apply to request it. Okay, and, and do, do we ever get applications for that? I think historically we did. I, I so I... So I don't know if somebody has come in for it, but it happens, right? And so that is where these, my intent with trying to bring this forward now is I have had complaints that I need to enforce. I'm bring, I had the code from chapter 12 and chapter, you know, title 19 actually don't talk as well together as they should. Um, so, the display, I have had retailers on the plaza They said they, they want to do maybe, I, I'm not going to, there's one that I know has already put tables out last summer because I walked by them. And so people, we just need some rules around what they do. And so what I've met with the chamber about is, okay, we're bringing this back. This is going to be the rules that apply to everything within our public spaces. And these are the you know, wanted to be very clear that they're going to need insurance and everything if they're going to use the public right of way for these types of uses and to get permits. And so we're trying to just clean it up at this point to bring it, move it forward. Okay, just one last question. Um, just purely coincidentally, my wife um, wanted to walk down to the plaza and have a glass of wine, and we went to this table outside. And we sat there and had a glass of wine, and I noticed that near us was another table from the same establishment with two chairs but it wasn't up against the frontage of the business it was located at the curb now there was still walking space between the table and chairs and the front of the business but the location of the table and chairs were at the curb not against the front of the building now is that going to be legal I think that's actually a really helpful question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so the language right now I think is a little unclear. So oh, we dealt with this on Pangloss. So on Pangloss on First Street East, when they had tables there, it made more sense because of the trees that the only way for them to get clearance was to have it against the curb. But the way that it's written, it says that the table should be against the building. Right. And so that's I think that's a, a good good discussion point okay well whether we care if the tables are against the curb or against the wall okay I'm sorry to have taken all that time but a car, parked car could hit somebody at a table right up against the curb whereas that would not happen if they were sitting next to the building that's a good point or a bicyclist if they go fast enough they'll help both <laughs> <laughs> Clarification. Yes. Yeah. Wouldn't wouldn't a lot of this be kind of evaluated as part of the site plan? Yeah. So could you could you theoretically could incorporate some language in here that if, if it is vague that this could be reviewed provided that we're meeting the five foot. Although I'm I'm a little concerned about five feet, but 
I mean, is there going to be enough space based on what there's the some pla- yeah, articulated? I mean, but I, to me, there there should be discretion pursuant or, or embedded into this language so that the site plan can thoroughly evaluate whether it's more appropriate to place the tables at the curb or against the, the building itself. So the idea behind putting them directly adjacent to the building is that you're reducing cross traffic, right? So if you put tables next to the road, then you're going to have more activity between a waiter and a pedestrian. And so the idea is really let's keep pedestrian traffic moving and keep the use against the use. Um, so that's why it wasn't kind of opened up in that sense. That's what I've also told the businesses when they asked for this <laughs> as well. Um, but I'm fine with, you know, leaving leniency if that's the intent. But my other concern was jumping the curb and hitting somebody or having a big truck um, go in rear first. <laughs> so um, just little things like that. Um, if there's other topics too, and you know, we did look at other cities, and five feet is the pretty much the standard. Um, they had asked for less, of course, um, but you know, we talked about it. And one of those things is if we've you know two people passing, or a mom holding her child's hand, um, just things like that. I'm just trying to keep in mind that. Just because three feet is what ADA needs for one path of travel, that's not adequate for two. So five feet is our city standard for sidewalks as well. I just have a couple of hopefully simple questions. Um, under the 12.06.050 terms of renewal, I'm just curious, is there, you know, they're only valid for a year. So is there a fee associated every time they're renewed? There is, yeah, it's in our fee schedule. So same, okay. it's the same thing, same process that we've had. Okay. And then the other question is 120606 of the revocation. So if you revoke, this kind of gets to enforcement, but if you invoke, if you revoke um, a permit, are they allowed to reapply? I, I didn't re- really I don't, read that. I don't anyway. see why not if they reapply and they comply with standards. But if they reapply and then they're a nuisance and then they reapply and then they're a nuisance and, and then it gets revoked again. So there's, I, I, I guess where I'm going is there's, is there, in the, under the enforcement, is there an opportunity to not renew if they are? I mean, we can add that. We can deny it too. We well, the revocation with the revocation, you can place um, a restriction on an ability to reapply under the same ownership or um, for the future. And staff has the ability to refer the application to the planning commission. So, if there's some repeat offender, well, I mean, if it's helpful to put the language in so that it's kind of codified that those are options, if you think that would be helpful, then... I don't know that it's a problem right okay. now that we deal with. Okay, who else? Now's your chance. Chime in or forever be moot, mute. I would just like to be as lenient as we can be because I really think the sidewalks are a lot more exciting and festive if there's uh, tables and displays and it just makes it a lot more of an interesting place. So I, I would err on the side of being as lenient as we are comfortable being. Anyone else? I, too, err on the side of being as flexible and lenient as possible. It was great during the pandemic when there was all this. It was The town was lively. It was like being in a European city as opposed to when the sidewalks roll up at 8 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, the possible action is what? Adopt a resolution forwarding a recommendation to City Council to introduce the ordinance. Okay. Who'd like to make that a motion? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. 
Commissioner Barbos? Yes. Commissioner Gordon Jenkins? Hi. Commissioner O'Neill? Yes. Commissioner Willers? Yes. Commissioner Wyrick? Yes. Vice Chair Dombach? Yes. Chair Barnett? Aye. The motion passes Aye. unanimously. <laughs> okay. So uh, that uh, takes us to the end of our agenda for tonight, unless the director has some comments. I will keep it very brief because I noticed that we we're hitting our 10 o'clock mark. Um, so the only thing I wanted to, s to really say is that we will not be having the joint meeting until June. And so I'll reach back out, but it looking like the first meeting of June. So I think it's June. The joint meeting with the city council? Correct, on the general plan. Okay. And I understand that our parking standards agenda is going to be on our next meeting? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. And uh, anything else, Jennifer? No? Nothing else. Okay. And are there any uh, commissioner comments? I have one. Yes? Um, what's the status of Hot Monk's tent? And is it still allowed to... It's gone. Yay! And what's going to happen next year? Because it's so atrocious. The same thing. Oh, wait, are you talking it about the atrocious. tent, or are you talking about the 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 green netting? I'm talking about the big plastic tent that hangs out over the perimeter fencing. So that is an annual thing. They they do it at all their locations. I noticed because I've now seen all of them. Um, so that is an annual thing. I think we are talking. The netting has been removed from the front um, of the structure. I've, some of you might have noticed that as well. Um, so that is um, not on our list to talk about. So. The plastic tent. No, the tent's gone. Yeah. I think they raised the sides up, and this, then the sides came back down again. I think the item's not on the agenda, so we probably. Oh, all right. <laughs> but if you want to agendize talking about tents again, we can do that. It makes me tense, but we can talk about tense, yeah, sure. Okay, there being nothing else, I'd like to hear a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Adjourned. Therese, I'm sorry, and, and I would like to get clarification. Maybe we, this is separate from the meeting, but is the alternate, should the alternate be welcome to give opinions on agenda items when she is acting as the alternate? When she's not sitting at the dais. When she's not sitting at the dais. 